Uh, first items of interest from commissioners. COVID opening, please. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you want to miss? Are you going to sing it? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. I couldn't possibly uh, uh, compete with with uh, your showing. I'm sure you could. <laughs> oh, I don't know that that's true. Uh, okay, COVID opening. Thanks for keeping me honest. In keeping with the Oregon Public Meetings Law, statutory land use hearing requirements, and Title 33 of the Portland City Code, the Portland Planning and Sustainability Commission is holding this meeting virtually. All members of the PSC are attending remotely, and the city has made several avenues available for the public to watch the broadcast of this meeting. The PSC is taking these steps as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and promote social distancing. The pandemic is an emergency that threatens the public health, safety, and welfare, which requires us to meet remotely by electronic communications. Thank you all for your patience, humor, flexibility, and understanding as we manage through this difficult situation to do the city's business. Eli, I appreciate you. Now, <laughs> items of interest from commissioners. Any? Um, Jeff, please. Thank you. Uh, I feel like I've been gone a long time because I missed one meeting. So, uh, And I also miss, unfortunately, the end of the retreat with Commissioner Rubio. So I was just curious, and maybe this has been updated and I wasn't around to get the update. Has there been a follow-up to our retreat with Commissioner Rubio? Any, any news that can be reported to our commission about where things are going? Bye. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Thanks, Jeff. Donnie Oliveira, Interim Director for BPS for the record. So, so Jeff, the, the status is we are, BPS staff have been at work, coordinating with Commissioner Rubio and her staff to bring a draft of potential actions that we would collectively work with you all on, on the next steps and implementing the recommendations that the report uh, conveyed. So at next week's officers meeting, BPS staff will be presenting a high level overview of, of potential actions and ways that we can collaborate and start to divvy up responsibilities. I will tease this by saying one of the ideas that have, has come out of the conversations is the potential of creating subcommittees that would take on uh, the certain chunks of work that the um, report outlined. And we look forward to sharing that next week, but we are, we are moving fast and furious to get something out there to begin work with you all. Thanks for the update. And I also want to uh, just note, um, because we are humans, this isn't necessarily on the agenda, but uh, that there was a, um, a horrifying school shooting um, uh, earlier today. I, I'd, I'd actually like to read um, Clint Smith's uh, tweet. Um, These are elementary school children who woke up this morning, who ate their favorite cereal, who tried their shoes in double knots. Sorry. <laughs> who laughed with friends on the bus now more than a dozen are dead this isn't normal it doesn't have to be this way it can't keep being this way and a reminder i'd actually uh i'd love us to take just a moment of silence Thank you. I think this is a, it's a reminder that in difficult times, decisions of courage and acts of courage are called for. And I'm just grateful to everyone here and everyone who is listening for your efforts to make our communities better in various ways and that we show up and we keep showing up. Um, and with that, forgive me, Patricia, to use that as the preamble. Uh, for your leadership and the director's chair, please, your director's report. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. And thank you for allowing us the opportunity to reflect on, on those events of the day. Appreciate that. And I'm sure others do too. Can you hear me okay? 
Okay, great. So just a quick um, update in terms of a director's report. It's customary for us to circle back with you on um, actions that council took on items that have been before this commission. So just wanted to share with you that the council did adopt the E-Zone project. Um, it went to council on February 16th for a first hearing and then April 14th for a second hearing. Um, and it did, uh, on May 18th, the city council did unanimously adopt uh, the, the E-Zone with the amendments as recommended. Um, and uh, council did unanimously um, vote to uh, make the uh, map amendments from that resulted from the site visits um, made substantial change to the new septic tank standard to allow it to apply to both new and replacement septic tank septic systems and minor and technical amendments to the zoning code, the comp plan and the natural resource inventory to align those documents and it is expected those those changes to the E zones and the zoning code will be effective October 1st of this year 2022 in accordance with also a May 18th resolution adopted by council to consolidate the effective dates of code updates to have them become effective on March 1st and October 1st. Um, and that's a project that resulted from the efforts of the multi-year permit improvement task force that you may have uh, heard something about. Also, um, last week was a big week uh, for us. The council also adopted the RIP2 uh, code package with four amendments. Those amendments included um, small technical amendments that staff recommended to just mostly typographical and things like that. And then also some amendments that were raised during the hearing um, by uh, people who provided testimony to the council. Those amendments included increasing the FAR for four plexes by 0.1 FAR to allow for opportunity for more three bedroom units a um, non-controversial front line, front property line amendment, adding a new deeper affordability option for a townhouse style six plexes. Um, as the PSC requested the staff work with the nonprofit housing providers to reach the compromise and delivered an amendment that was supported by the four council members who were present last week. So thank you for your work on that package. Um, I know you all worked very hard on that package to bring it to uh, where it was um, ready for council action. And so that did happen and they will be um, acting, taking a second reading on that and it will go into effect as an emergency kind of emergency ordinance by June 1st because of the state um, deadline to have these uh, provisions in effect by July 1st. So that's the quick wrap up of those two items and that uh, concludes the director's report. And so we're ready to go into the agenda items when you're ready, Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you, Patricia. Uh, and, and thank you, uh, neither of them are here. So it, it feels more meaningful to thank them in their absence. Uh, thanks to, to Gabe for uh, representing the PSC for E-Zones and, uh, and Erica for doing so for RIP2 and uh, helping us through that entire process. Um, uh, and now consent agenda, consideration of the minutes uh, from May 10th. Does anyone care to make a motion? I'll make a motion to adopt the minutes. Thank you, Eli. Yeah, second. second. Thank you, Valeria. This is Valeria. Pass. Cheers. Uh, so Eli firsts and Valeria seconds. Um, you raise your uh, virtual or true hand, fleshy hand. <clears throat> okay, thank you. And I'll be okay. abstaining. I'll be abstaining because I wasn't there. Oh, oh good. Thank you all. Um, that does that. And now let us go to our uh, Substantive, the Title 11 Amendments, and welcoming uh, Brian Landau and Nick Desai uh, from Parks. Please take it away. Thank you, Steph. Thank Hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, my name is Nick Desai, and I'm here with Brian Landau. Together, we're co-leading a project uh, to update the tree code, this phase of it. 
You'll notice I'm in a park here from my background. I noticed a dog, a very loud barking dog in the background. So excuse me if you hear him, I might scoop him up and hold him if he gets a little loud. I'm going to share my screen because we have a short mini presentation and then we can move into the um, discussion and hearing. Okay, I believe my screen is being shared. Okay, thanks for the thumbs up. So uh, we are presenting a public hearing recommendation uh, for the Title 11 Amendment Project. And most of you are familiar with this, quick overview. This is a multi-phase project. This is phase one of a larger project. This includes, phase one includes technical and minor Title 11 tree code amendments or updates. Phase two slated to occur over 2022-2024 is an update to the urban forest management plan. A uh, long overdue update and uh, we're thrilled that it's going to occur. And phase three is uh, involves more substantive amendments which might involve work with other bureaus an element of data analysis. And uh, that is slated to occur after or uh, overlapping with the urban forest management plan update. Those updates amendments will be informed by the updated urban forest management plan. Now, uh, a couple months ago, we um, published a draft of the updated tree code changes. We have a project page which detailed that information. That information was publicly available and open for public comment. Um, we presented that information to our partner bureaus, to the bureaus of planning and sustainability, the Urban Forestry Commission, uh, Development Review Advisory Committee, and um, some other public groups. And we received public comment and incorporated that feedback into a new draft of amendments. Not a new draft, but we updated our um, our first draft, and that is the draft that. Uh, has been reviewed for this meeting. Now, some significant changes to note between that first draft and the second draft are captured on this slide right here. And one of those, uh, I'll just go through the list here. So the first is to, uh, the amendment was originally to grant the city forester authority to approve removal of dead heritage trees without urban forestry commission consent. Um, Current code allows for the removal of heritage trees that are dangerous. If a tree is dead and dangerous, that this still applies, but if it's simply dead, it's fairly it's a fairly quick process for review by the Urban Forestry Commission. And uh, removal of designation still requires city council approval. So we removed this. There was, um, there was uh, some suggestion that it was not necessary at this time. Number six, add administrative review step to appeal process. We simply changed the timeline to appeal from 10 days to 14 days to be consistent with references in other city code. Number 10, consider tree removal impacts to other trees. Uh, this requires greater review than within the purview of type A permits. So we removed this reference from the type A permit section and just kept it in the type B permit section. It involves a greater review. Number 36, definition of a dangerous tree to include threats to the urban forest. The proposed language was too vague and open to interpretation or misuse. That was uh, some of the feedback that we received. Uh, the intent was to uh, initially to protect specifically from fast spreading pests and pathogens, which could be uh, threats to the urban forest. We are going to reconsider this for the next amendment cycle and look at some, uh, some more specific and better language to capture that intent. Number 42, amend permit requirements for pruning in E-zones and wildfire hazard zones. Uh, feedback was that the proposed removal of pruning restrictions in these zones could have a devastating effect on a really critical, sensitive, ecological, natural area in our city and across our city. Uh, as this, this zone is, uh, requires interbureau work, it's, uh, it would require coordination with BPS and it therefore falls outside the scope of this current set of amendments. Um, 
we will consider it in the uh, future substantive amendment um, phase. I want to note that the concern of a defensible space is understandable. And current code does allow for proactive management of trees in these zones. Uh, without a permit, trees within 10 feet of a building or structure can be pruned. Pruning of coniferous trees within 30 feet of structures in the wildfire hazard zones is uh, allowed without a permit. And this importantly addresses fuel ladders as conifers can have greater fuel loads than broadleaf trees. And a really important one, pruning to abate an immediate danger is allowed in these zones without a permit, in the wildfire hazard zone without a permit. Uh, I'll also follow up that in communication with the Bureau of uh, Fire and Rescue and uh, BPS, we identified important opportunities to increase public awareness of current code allowances through education, including uh, that this is a free permit. The permit requires an arborist pruning plan to ensure proper arboriculture practice. And by requiring an arborist plan, this makes it a faster process, obviating the need for an urban forestry inspection. So it's a fairly quick process. Prior to Title 11, an environmental review was required, and that was a lengthy process as well. And finally, the pruning permit only applies to native trees in the environmental zones. And so uh, I will add one more um, amendment, uh, one more change that has come to our attention, which we will be incorporating. And um, that was with respect to number 32. It's not uh, captured on this slide, but uh, providing City Forester with authority to issue stop work order when unpermitted tree work is occurring. We're going to make the language more clear to communicate that this is only relative to violations of Title 11. And so that's not currently in this draft, but it will be um, one of the outcomes from, um, from today's discussion. And so let's see here. Uh, the flow for the evening, public hearing of uh, written testimony and oral testimony. And then there will be uh, time for discussion and recommendation. And uh, just a quick timeline, what's coming up, July 20th is our city council hearing. And uh, there will be, um, we will be updating uh, draft uh, with, or the final version with feedback received from um, Urban Forestry Commission and Planning and Sustainability Commission as well. I will stop sharing now if I can figure it out. There we go. And um, I, uh, I yield my time. Thank you. Um, Brian, were you issuing as if to speak or? No, I have nothing, nothing to add. I think we're good to go to uh, the testimony right now. Great. Before we do that, I believe uh, Jeff's hand is up. So sure. do that. Yeah, Steph, thank you. <clears throat> And thank you, Parks Bureau people. I have more of a process question before we get into this. So we, we just heard there are going to be further changes to the document. So we're being asked to make a recommendation tonight, though we're not going to be have the final version before us. So that's just a question at slash concern. And the other thing, what exactly is our role when it comes to Title 11? Are we just sort of a unofficial recommendation body? Do we have any authority under the code? What 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 is Planning Commission's role when it comes to managing Title Letter? And I'll leave that to anyone who's ready to answer. Um, I just want to clarify, I'm just going to, I'm going to um, defer to Brian because I hope I didn't misspeak when I talked about the process, the future process um, with feedback. So um, I apologize if I misspoke, but Brian, can you just uh, respond to that? Yeah, um, on the first first part, um, I think the, the the only amendment that is changing, um, uh, they, that the only one that is different than what you've already been provided with is the one that Nick mentioned about um, the city forester being able to issue a stop work order. The the intent of the amendment is not changing. Um, we received feedback. E e Eli actually raised concern that um, it could be interpreted as. Um, City Forester could issue a stop work order, regardless of whether a violation of Title 11 is occurring or not. And the intent was to be only in situations where a violation of Title 11 is occurring. So 
that is the only change that we're making. And it's just to um, clean up the language, not to change the intent or the impact of it. Um, on the second one, um, so Title 11 uh, says that a, a, um, in changes to the code, there will be a, a public hearing of the Urban Forestry Commission. And then if changes to specific sections of Title 11 are occurring, a public hearing of the, of the PPSC will occur as well. And those are sections 11.5, 11.6, and 11.7. And we do have a few um, amendments to those parts of the code, which is why well, we're holding a public hearing. So um, the role in the PSC is really to provide, um, to hold a public hearing, um, provide uh, um, advice, and then um, we would uh, we would appreciate it if, if you if you are supportive of the code amendments that you would send um, a statement to city city council expressing that su support. But um, I'm less, I'm not as familiar with Title 33, but I, I think the PSC has a much more active and clear code uh, role in changes to Title 33. Um, but it's more of a um, uh, um, uh, advisory role here. Thank you both. Um and Eli and Katie, I just are these process. I just want to ask for these process questions. Okay, great. Eli. Yeah, I think I might be able to the, the titles Brian just referenced are the sections of Title 11 related to trees and development situations. My understanding is that for those titles, for those sections of the title, um, Urban Forestry and the PIC are dual recommending bodies. For the rest of Title 11, it's just the Urban Forestry Commission. So if I'm wrong, let me know. But so I think that we are the recommending body um, along with forestry on those, those sections. Most of the recommendations in this package don't fall, don't impact development situations, but a few do. Thanks. And I just want to thank Jeff for bringing that up because I brought it up, I think, last um, at our last meeting, which is basically I'd really like more clarity around why we're seeing something almost on everything. And I so appreciate you bringing that up, Jeff. Thank you. Commissioners, if, if I could just. Um take a moment to say that that is something that we really understand from you and, and is also just good practice. And so we're going to try to be much more clear going forward about what action is before the commission formally and whether something is more informational or you're, it's being brought to you in more of an advisory capacity. But I think um, it sounds like in this case, there's some very specific uh, provisions of Title 11 when it pertains to development review, that this body has a more formal recommending role. So um, that that's probably a good framework for your deliberation on this matter, if that's helpful. <laughs> um, Eli is that, okay, uh, Jeff. Yeah, just a quick follow-up, it, it may be helpful and maybe Nick and Brian, you can do this when we come back after the public testimony. Let's just point out which ones fall within the code section Eli cited that are development-oriented changes to Title 11, which, which apparently we're co-recommenders on, and which ones aren't, because I think that might just help, at least would help me think through a response to be clear which ones are really within our bailiwick and which ones are less formally within our authority. Please, thank you. Um, just in response, uh, we didn't do it this time, but I, at our last last time we came to this meeting, we um, provided a subset of those uh, those updates which were relevant to this um, commission. And um, yeah, for next time, we'll make sure we provide it for each meeting. Nick, can I can I just suggest that if it might be helpful to the commission, if, if you wanted to bring your PowerPoint back up and just point out the primary changes that fall into that, those more development review provisions of Title 11, just so they have a sense of that, if that's not putting you on the spot too much, if that's easy for you to point out. Sure. Yeah, I can do that. I can share the screen. I'm going to ask Brian to help me out with... Um, identifying those that are relevant. Okay. Yeah, and I'm actually pretty sure that none of these fall into, um, and just for everyone's, uh, so 11.5 is specifically the trees and development situations part of the code. 
11.6 is the uh, is the uh, detected technical specifications part of the code, which um, those technical specifications do um, have relevancy in development situations. And 11.7 is the um, enforcement part of the code. So again, enforcement actions can occur in development. So just to give you a little breakdown of where those fall into place. And actually, um, none of these significant changes in the current draft um, were to any of those sections of the code. We, we did receive comments on several of these. Um, actually, a few of these changes were directly in response to comments that members of the PSC made, um, which is why we wanted to highlight, highlight these here. So in light of that, just to summarize, this is Patricia for the record, um, it, it seems that the provisions that are being amended here, proposed to be amended here, are not in the section that has that, that requirement. But this is still something that I think is, you know, generally of interest um, to the commission and um, we're here. So um, any, you know, recommendation that you have or input that you'd like to provide would be appreciated. And I don't know if uh, J, JP or Steph knows that, were, were, there, were there any public comments that signed up as well? There is one, okay. yes. And yeah, and uh, once we get to the other side, I, I think there'll be questions in like, what would, uh, what precisely, what are the words and what is precisely going to be asked of us <laughs> in terms of a movement? And would you, uh, are there any questions related to this uh, slide before we move to hearing testimony? And if, if not, uh, thank you. Um, well, let us move to, um, to public testimony. Uh, Kina, I am going to try to promote you to panelist right now, Kina Rubin. There you are. Thank you for joining us um, and for taking the time. And we would love to hear your three minutes and you are muted. Forgive me, I know, Zoom. Okay, can you hear me? Yay, okay. I just wanna say I'm wondering if the reason I'm the only one is um, a problem getting in because the latest link I was just sent before the meeting, I could not get into. I got into this meeting because I went back to the May 1st email um, that Julie sent me and that's how I got in the meeting. Um, I'm sorry you had difficulty. We uh, we do have a record of only having one person oh, having signed okay, up, fine. But, all right. but I appreciate you caring for other people. Okay, all right. <laughs> so I'm Keena Rubin with Trees for Life Oregon. Uh, trees provide critical services to help us meet the climate crisis we're in. They shade us, cool and clean our air and water, capture storm water, sequester carbon, and provide habitat. Our trees and the public health and environmental benefits they provide have never been more important than they are right now. Yet recent studies document that the city is starting to lose canopy, especially in areas of East Portland, home to some of the city's most vulnerable populations. This highly disturbing trend increases the urgency of preserving big tree canopy and space for new large trees to be planted. The technical tree code amendments come at a time when a flurry of multiple bureau activities has our attention. PBOT's pedestrian design guide, the Water Bureau's rule on distance between street trees and water pipes, RIP 1 and RIP 2's shrinking allocation of outdoor area, and the city's task force to streamline the development permitting process all raise alarms over the low priority that most bureaus place on the urban forest. Collectively, these rules and codes will erode canopy, including space to plant new canopy in the future. We appreciate urban forestry staff's responsiveness to early public input on the technical amendments. We're pleased that the amendments we supported remain in the proposal and that staff are proposing to defer the amendments we raise concerns about until the more substantive code revisions. 
We ask that you support and recommend city council approval of these Title 11 amendments. We particularly support number one and two, which would make explicit that trees are urban infrastructure and that capital projects are in part regulated by Title 11. Amendments 427 and 32 would improve transparency and strengthen enforcement authority by granting the city forester authority to add heritage trees to property deeds, place liens on properties when violations aren't resolved, and issue stop work orders when Title I regulated activities are taking place without a permit. Amendment 10 would broaden the criteria to be considered when reviewing tree removal permit applications. We also urge you to recommend that City Council expedite its comprehensive Title 11 review by combining it with the upcoming Urban Forest Management Plan update. The two are closely related. Every single day, Portland residents are losing precious large trees because of a weak, outdated code. Many of its provisions need to be revisited. Timing is of the essence. We must act now if we don't want Portland to become a city of dwarf trees that provide no shade or health benefits to residents, or to become a city of few trees at all. The great degreening of our city has to be reversed if we want Portland to remain livable. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for your written testimony as well. Okay, and with that, we will uh, close um, testimony and uh, open up for uh, PSC thoughts. And I wonder, um, see, I, I do wonder if, uh, if either Nick or Brian, you happen to have a table of amendments that we are considering for today. Oh, Brian, love your nod. <laughs> Well, and then that, that, that should have been included in the documents that Julie sent out. Um, I did want to offer at, at, at the last meeting when we briefed the PSC in March, we did show a PowerPoint that highlighted seven or eight of the amendments that were kind of the most significant and fell into the PSC's purview. Um, I have that PowerPoint. I'd be happy to give that again if that helps sort of prime the conversation. Fantastic. Um, I'm realizing. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> we, we didn't do that because we didn't want to just repeat ourselves, but also I'm recognizing um, it's it, it's a it's a big package of amendments and so it could be helpful just to spend a little time on that since we have another half hour at least here, so. Great, and I think <laughs> we, we experience eons in between PSC meetings, so. <laughs> yes, for sure. Okay, no problem. Let me uh, share my screen and I'll just kind of go through that pretty quickly. Okay here. So this is just the PowerPoint from back in March. So, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll just have this, this is about eight, eight or nine slides. Um, and again, the intent here was just to um, explain a little more detail the ones, um, the, the, the amendments that we, we felt um, either just required more explanation or had, um, were more in the policy, minor policy change rather than just um, a technical amendment. Um, the first one is really straightforward. This is amendment um, number 15. And so if, if you have that spreadsheet that uh, was included, I think in your, your package, you'll, you'll see it in there. Uh, clarifying the city forester review is required in city projects. Um, this is a pretty straightforward clarification amendment. Um, there, um, this, was more, this was more of an issue early in Title 11, which came about in 2015, where um, the, the way the code was worded made it, made it open to a little bit of interpretation that um, city forester review and capital improvement project was only required if a tree was proposed to be uh, removed. This clarifies that um, no city forester authority um, or review is required, one, to ensure that trees are, are, are preserved, but also CIPs can trigger tree, uh, tree planting requirements. And so um, this, is a, this is a pretty straightforward clarification uh, am amendment. Um, the second one is um, sort of the minor policy change, but um, there is a provision in city code, this is in 11.5 in the development chapter, and um, which states that um, for projects that are affecting more than 20 linear feet of the street, street frontage, um, 
the well, let me, let me leave it back back up. The typical street tree planting requirement in Title 11 is every 25 feet a street tree is required. So, in a typical development situation, if you have a um, 5,000 square foot lot, that's going to be probably two two street trees are are required. Um, for projects larger than 200 linear feet of frontage, the code has different language, and it says to integrate existing street trees and maximize new street tree planting. Um, it was a really well-intentioned code, um, uh, code, code language, and it was really intended to do exactly what it says, to sort of maximize the street tree planting. Um, in practice, these projects, which are typically capital improvement projects, when they get to that 200 feet, it's usually with Bureau of Transportation, Bureau of Environment, Rail Services, um, it made it difficult um, uh, to determine how many street trees should be planted. And so what we really are proposing is removing that to simply apply the street tree every 25 feet standard um, in all, all scenarios. So there have been times where this part of code has been helpful, but often it just creates a little bit of confusion and having a clear 25 foot standard um, uh, seems like a pre preferable way to go. So um, that's what's being proposed here. Um, enforcement authority, uh, the public comment re referenced this. So um, currently in enforcement scenarios, um, the city forge is not able to assess liens. Um, we are able to assess liens for the enforcement fee, but if it is a scenario where a street tree um, is dead and dangerous and the city forester um, issues an order for the street tree to be removed, um, we can we can place a lien on the property if that if if the enforcement penalty is not paid. But if we were to do the work of removing the street tree, we could not place a lien on the property to recover the cost of that work. Um, what this effectively does is it creates a very uh, uh, Byzantine and ineffective process where we actually refer our liens to the bureau of, of our enforcement actions to the bureau of development services services. Um, it's a convoluted process and it um, adds time and uh, is not effective. So this, this effectively um, gives the city forester the ability to place those liens um, rather than having to refer them to the Bureau of Development Services. Ryan, um, before yeah. we go on, um, are, would, you, would you prefer entertaining uh, comments or questions uh, for each slide or would you like to move through i think it should be fine there's only a few and so i, I think it would actually be fine to do um questions um so yeah that's a good time to stop is there are there any questions so far that i should go back or um free just to keep on moving move, moving through here all right i'll, I'll say any um uh, this is actually one of the amendments that Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, definition of a dangerous tree does not consider the site condition. Um, and this is really basically saying that um, there are scenarios where a tree may be, may be considered a dangerous tree, but it's not due to the um, health or form of the tree, it's due to the conditions around it. And, if, and what, what the, the goal of this here is to simply allow the option of improving the conditions around the tree so the tree can be uh, uh, preserved. Um, this is really just giving, um, providing options there. Um, this is the amendment that was removed. Um, sorry. The... Jeff? Yes, I see Jeff. You... Brian, I had a question there. Um, yeah. So determining whether a tree is dangerous, I know there's sort of a, a technical definition of what constitutes a dangerous tree. Aren't you now expanding the definition of dangerous tree to include subjective surrounding site conditions? We are expanding, um, I don't think how to phrase that. We are, we are, yes, we are, we are expanding it, but the, the, the goal is the, the intent is not to consider more trees dangerous, it's to Make it clear what site, what conditions can be improved in order to make the tree not, um, not a dangerous tree. So, if I have a tree and I hire an arborist, and the arborist applies the traditional definition of danger tree, it's leaning, or I you know there's several categories. And my arborist says, "Yep, that's a danger tree. Next windstorm, that's that's probably going to come down." This now gives the city to say, "No, 
we don't consider it dangerous. We think you can mitigate the danger and not allow it to be taken down. Is that one possible interpretation of what this code amendment allows? Um, I'm not letting, and I see Nick's hands raised. Um, I, I'm, I'm not an arborist, and so I don't, I don't want to weed. You know, I'm, I'm not either, but <laughs> well, and, and I, I'll, I'll let Nick. But I think I, I would say that um, that is okay. that that is currently something that we would do. Is if 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 a if a tree is dangerous, but there are actions that can be taken to to make, mitigate the danger, so the tree that can be preserved, then yes, that is something we would do. Um, but Nick, so, so that's really not a technical amendment. That's a substantive amendment broadening a definition. I'm just trying to make sure I understand what you're doing here. Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't quite call it a tech amendment. I think it, it, it does fall, fall into the, I will, we would consider minor minor policy change, but it's, it's more to deal with, um, it's really to provide options and scenarios where if the tree doesn't have to be re removed or there are things that we can do short of removing a tree, which again, the goal in the code is to preserve he otherwise healthy trees, then that is what we're trying to provide here. Nick, sorry, I keep I keep talking. You have your oh, that's okay. I, I was just going to provide one more example to illustrate this situation. Suppose you have a tree on a slope, and that slope is prone to landslides due to some factors, maybe erosion or something like that. Um, and the tree is considered dangerous because the slope is unstable. A way of addressing site conditions would be to stabilize the slope. You'd then be able to preserve the tree. Okay, well, I'll, I'll shoot straight. With it. That bothers me. <laughs> so you're saying there's a danger tree, it's in danger of falling, but if you were to do a lot of expensive mitigation, you know, excavate the bank, stabilize the tree, then you could save the tree. I, I, to me, that's, that's, ex, that's a significant expansion of a requirements put on a property owner who has a danger tree. So uh, I, I'm I, Personally, I, I'm not comfortable with that, particularly as part of a technical code amendment package. I, I don't think that belongs in this package. I think that's that's too substantive to me, a change. So I'll just, uh, I, I think it should be deleted, but we can see if other commissioners agree with me or not. Okay. But thank, thank you for explaining. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me move on here. This next one, number 36, is one of the removed amendments that Nick covered earlier. So I'm gonna skip through that. Um, this is another technical clarification. It's actually one that the Bureau of Development Services asked for. Um, Title 11 has on-site tree, tree preservation requirements in development, um, but it did not provide guidance on if a tree is straddling um, uh, a property line, um, how that tree should count. So this effectively takes the process that BDS has been using for those situations and just puts it um, in the code. Um, this one dealt with um, the the definition of multi-dwelling change in Title 33 um, since Title 11 was drafted, um, specifically with regard to the residential infill infill project. So um, this updated uh, that 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 de definition and how different um, <clears throat> aspects of Title 11 uh, applied to those. Um, and then these are old, old slides. So anyway, I hope, hope that was helpful to frame your conversation here. Thank you. Valeria. Yes. Brian, um, a question on that um, expansion for, for the straddling tree that you just had. And tell me if I'm way off in the way that I interpret it. And I want to just pose like a hypothetical situation. So um, let's say if if with the amendment, would that mean that, for example, let's say if a house puts a native you in the backyard, they have to have X amount of canopy. Would that tree that is straddling the tree count towards? the canopy needed for the ADU and then not require the owner to plant a new tree or can you, or yeah, how to, again, tell me if I'm off with this scenario. So, um, I don't, sorry, I, I, I didn't quite follow the scenario, but let me, I, I think I can just kind of talk about it broadly and then um, maybe if I don't answer your question, we'll, we can, you can 
um, describe it again. So uh, basically in development situation and take a um, single family or R, R5 lot. Um, in the development situation, on-site tree density requirements do need 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 to, to be met. And for an R5 lot, um, that's basically 40 percent of the lot needs to be covered by future tree canopy. And code basically provides here's how many trees need to be planted for that um, for that density requirement to be met. Um, the code allows existing on-site trees to count towards that requirement. Um, and so if you have an existing tree, it's very easy to um, determine, okay, that is a large tree that, that accounts for 20% of the site, site coverage. It's not clear if, it, if that tree straddles the property. Does the whole tree count towards that property? Does only half of the tree? And so this basically provides um, a formula for um, a portion, a, a sort of percentage of the canopy um, provided by that tree to count towards that. Um, and so I, I do, I, I am not familiar enough with ADU specifically, and so I don't know how fully that would trigger those on-site tree planting requirements, um, but in that sort of situation, yes. That, that's not really helpful explanation. I guess my thoughts are, is this amendment incentivizing or disincentivizing people to plant uh, yeah. additional trees because that tree that's trailing tree is being counted towards it. You know what I mean? That, that yeah. That's where my mind was going. I was just trying to understand um, the intention or maybe unintended consequence about that. But Yeah, I see what you're saying. I don't, I don't think it's doing either. It's really provide, it's, it's intended to provide clarity in those scenarios so that in the development si situation, it's clear how many trees need, need to be planted beyond what is already there. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, thank you. That's that's really helpful. Sure. <coughs> you yeah. um, Thanks. Um, I I'm gonna as a dangerous tree designation something that um, provides a burden on a property owner, or is it something that a property owner might want because they want to take the tree out and it reach on chain makes it easier to do so. So I said I don't understand what the impact of defining expanding the definition of dangerous tree means. That's that's one question. One other is, um, I think I know the answer to this, but I want to double check if, because I've run into this situation a couple of times myself. If you are doing half street improvements required by the city as a condition of development, and those half street improvements as defined by PBOT standard profiles, let's say, require the removal of street trees, um, does this expand, does this um, mean that the urban forester has to approve those tree removals or does the urban forester have um, no role in that. Um, and currently, I think the urban forester does not have an official. They they can't like tell Peabody you have to adjust the sidewalk to preserve the tree. My understanding is that um, that that that's not something the power of the urban forestry does. Does this code amendment change the power dynamics in that situation? It would not. No. Okay. So, um, thanks. So maybe the first question: Can you share a little bit what the dangerous tree means? Is it? Yeah, I think I'll let, I'll let Nick um, respond more to that. I would say that it would be, uh, <clears throat> the outcome would be situationally dependent. It really depends on uh, the situation at hand. And uh, this proposed amendment is an attempt to uh, offer alternatives to tree removal. And in some cases, that alternative might be less expensive than tree removal. So it really depends on the situation. Uh, Valeria and Katie, I'm sorry, actually, could I stop? Uh, Eli, did that answer your question? I, I think I'm still struggling with this in a way that makes me think it's a more substantial change than I first thought. So if we have, so I, I think it, I have enough on that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Valeria and then Katie. Yeah, on that note, I mean, when someone requests a tree removal, they still are required to, once they remove it, they're still required to add another tree, as I understand it. So what this amendment is aiming for is, which in itself, tree removal, I mean, can be quite expensive, um, right? 
So I'm just trying to understand this danger, like how would this dangerous tree definition provide a better alternative given that we like, given like Jeff mentioned, like the potential amount of work that it would, it might include in like, uh, you know, uh, improving the the situation, whether it's a slope or whatever it is that is happening. So um, like, what is the, I'm having a hard time understanding what is the public benefit uh, when we out, outweigh it versus the tree removal. Um, yeah. But I do understand that we want to keep big trees like that. That is a goal like that's so this dangerous tree is any kind of tree, not. Yeah, sorry, I'll stop. Yeah, yeah. and, and I, I, just want, I, I, I appreciate all these all these these, these comments. I can definitely under, understand um, where lies are, are, are coming from. So, um, you know, I, I, I think in the, the, the scenario that Nick presented, I think, is a good example where um, I mean, if, if there is a dangerous tree on, so a dangerous tree is, can be considered a violation of, of code. So if you have a large tree and um, if there is a dead large tree on private property, um, we might get a request for code enforcement. And then we might say, go to the property owner and say, there is a dead tree, that tree could fail, that could pose a threat to, um, could th pose a threat to public safety. And so we can issue, we, we might issue, um, it's really directed to have that tree removed. There could be situations though, where we, we might say, listen, this tree is healthy, but because of the site conditions, like the steep slope that Nick mentioned, um, it is, it is a, it is a, it, the tree is posing uh, a p p potential threat. Um, so rather than it just be, you have to remove the tree this flexibility allows us to work with the property owner to address the address the site condition, making the tree dangerous, rather than the only option being removing that, that tree. Um, there are there is there's parts of code that talk about um, you know unreasonable cost burden, and so um, I think Jeff brought up the the example of well, will they have to build an extremely expensive uh, retaining wall in order to ad address it? The goal here is not to completely elevate the cost burden to a point where it's just so expensive. It's, it's really just to be able to provide these options where if we can preserve an otherwise healthy tree that is providing the services and benefits that trees do, um, that's an option that we want to be able to have and be able to give um, the property owner that that that, that, that option too. I 100% support that. I think the issue may be the name of the amendment because I hear you talk more about a uh, dangerous uh, situation or dangerous situations to preserve a tree rather than dangerous tree like it just it's yeah. it's it's hard to interpret it in the other ways that we are today so um, but with the framing just how you explained it that makes a lot of sense and I would be in support of that got it thanks and then yeah, I had a, a question about that too, and I think you, you've answered it, but I'm not sure. So let me paraphrase and see if I can tell. So in other words, you go out and the tree is dangerous for some reason, and um, they could take it down or they could do this other mitigation. Is that what you mean? Like, in other words, you're, you're coming up with a second alternative and they can make the decision based on cost or their love of the tree or whatever to do that. So in other words, it's not replacing the just remove it. It's um, it's another alternative. Right. Am I saying that right? Yes. OK. Exactly. Can I can I read this code? Because I think we're talking around the edges on this. Um, it says dangerous tree is one where the condition of the tree presents a foreseeable danger of inflicting damage that cannot be alleviated by treatment, pruning, and the ad language or by addressing site conditions. So I think I understand the intention of this language, um, but in practice, someone could say that the dangerous, this tree is dangerous um, because, um, sorry, a dangerous tree is one where the condition of the tree presents a foreseeable danger of inflicting damage that cannot be alleviated by treatment, pruning, or addressing site conditions. So one way to solve the dangerous tree problem is to move your house that it's leaning against or to build a retaining wall. This, this does create the burden for the property owner, 
Um, I think that the intention that you guys have, um, mm -hmm. it could be mis misapplied in that manner according to the code, I believe. Um, I think your intention is to say that you have an, opp you have an opportunity to cure, the, the cure opportunity could be meaning changing your site conditions. You have the chance to deal with the tree by changing site conditions, but I don't think that's what your current language does. I think as written, um, you know, someone calls a calls your neighbor, your neighbor calls the, the tree inspector, and the tree inspector is claiming you have a dangerous tree because it's leaning over your, you know, your ADU. And then the city inspector says, Yeah, it's not a dangerous tree, so you just have to move your ADU. I mean, like you obviously don't intend that, but I think that's what your language does, which is why I'm uncomfortable as written. I think you probably could reframe it to get your real intent there. Well, can can I jump in on Eli and what you just said? If a tree is dangerous under the current code, it's leaning over, it's got dead branches hanging over the neighbor's porch, it's a dangerous tree under the current code, and a property owner could demonstrate that to the city and be allowed to take it down. If the city wants to say, yes, you're right, it is dangerous, but here's some mitigation you could do, you can do that. There's, there's nothing you know, preventing the city from when they when they acknowledge a tree is inherently dangerous saying, but you know what, here's some minimal mitigation that would save it. What you seem to be doing is creating a mandatory subjective review that says it's a dangerous tree due to it, the nature of the tree, it's leaning over, but we're not going to let you take it down because we, the city, think these alternative mitigations are better. And I, I just think that's creating a new subjective regulatory step in this process. And I'm, I'm uncomfortable with that. If a private property owner or homeowner's got a tree that's got them nervous, they've got an arbor saying, yeah, you, you should take that down. I don't think they should have the added burden of going to the city and saying, okay, now let's argue about appropriate mitigation, how much appropriate mitigation, what would it cost? I think the current code is good enough and I'm, I'm not, I just don't see a need to expand the code definition. The end game you want is to be able to inform a property owner of some mitigation options. Great, you can go ahead and do that under the nature of your, your business right now. You don't need a code enforcement hammer. And so anyway, I, I, I hope we're at least all clear on what the issue is, so. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I do want to clarify that, um, you know, there, that precise scenario you you sort of laid out there is not really how it would play out. And um, if if a, if a tree is meeting other standards of um, under the non-development parts of the code 11.4, um, the tree permit would still be permitted for for re removal if it is on an otherwise um, dead, dying, or dangerous tree. It, it, the, the intent here is not to not allow tree removal applications because of dramatic changes to the site condition that may um, alleviate some of, some of that. But um, I do definitely hear the feedback that you're providing here, especially e e Eli, the concerns about how it could be um, interpreted. So we're definitely gonna take this back with us. Oriana? Yeah, um, forgive me if this is something that is obvious in the code, but. How do trees of heaven uh, factor into the, the dangerous tree world? Yeah, Nick, you want to talk about nuisance, nuisance trees a little bit? <laughs> sure. So yeah, trees of heaven are nuisance trees. They're on our nuisance tree list. Um, they are um, <clears throat> they're assessed for danger using a tree risk assessment protocol by a certified arborist, ideally. And, um, and so if they are um, within that definition of um, having dangerous aspects, we do a site condition um, or we do a, a risk assessment and that involves looking at the um, impacts and um, consequences of failure. And so um, it would be assessed just like any other tree. Sorry, quick, quick follow up. Because it's a nuisance tree, is there any interaction between the nuisance tree side and the dangerous tree side? Especially just thinking about some of the, the danger that's posed by a lot of trees of heaven to foundations and a lot of the danger that's not always uh, obvious. Uh, and I think a, a general uh, 
desire from many people in the community to have trees of heaven be easier to remove and, and classified in ways that uh, address the impact they have on our, on our infrastructure and on other trees. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't like trees of heaven. Can I jump in? I thought that if it was a nuisance tree, you could just take it out. Just like you, yeah. take you don't have to have a special, it doesn't have to be nuisance and dangerous. If it's a nuisance tree, track me up wrong, you can take it out. Yeah, I was just going to clear, clarify that. Nick was talking about specifically with a dangerous tree scenario, but um, nuisance trees, if they, um, nuisance trees are basically uh, ex exempt from a lot of requirements. So if you want to remove a nuisance tree, um, that that's a pretty straightforward tree removal permit. If you're if it's in a development situation, um, nuisance trees are exempt from the trees that need to be preserved on site. So um, the code does allow for pretty easy removal of those. So Valeria, and then I'd like to pop in. Yeah, last question. Um, am I right to assume that these dangerous trees are that we're talking about will most likely be mature old trees in the city be or am I far off just because like in my mind we are trying really hard to preserve our current um, canopy and I think it's been um, researched that what helps more than planting new trees is preserving our big trees so um I, I like where this is going, but I want to make sure that I have the right assumption um, with my intention. Yeah, with the goal, with that goal in mind. Thanks. Yeah, um, I'll just say first, thank you. That's, yes, tr preserving the canopy we have is um, absolutely essential. And tree planting is important, and it is it is part of the long-term strategy for growing our forest. But um, most of the canopy growth we get year after year is from existing trees growing larger. It's not from newly newly planted trees. So anyway, I thank thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, I don't, Nick. I I, I wouldn't say that necessarily large trees are more likely to be dangerous, just because there are different ways the trees can pose a, a, a danger. But yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'd, I'd agree with you on that. Yeah, it's um, but <clears throat> it depends on the tree. It depends on the situation. Yeah. Um, I'm hearing uh, this, this, we've we've had a, a substantive conversation about 29. I don't mean to to truncate it. I'm curious if anyone has um, any questions or comments on any other of the amendments that are before us. Jeff, yeah, sorry, just got a couple of more. Uh, one was, and I asked this question last time, Nick and Brian, it has to do with giving the forester stop work authority. And I asked the question, is that, does she, does he or she, does the forester currently have that authority in the code? And uh, so what, what is this? Is this new authority being granted or is there some, is there existing authority? Yeah, great, great question. So the way the code is written right now is it says that um, if there's a violation of Title 11 occurring um, and a threat to public safety is, um, is, is pre presented, then either the city forester or the um, director of the Bureau of Development Services can issue a stop work order. Um, the proposed amendment we have is basically to take out that um, and a threat to public safety is, is, is present. And the goal there really is um, the city forester should be able to issue a stop work order if a tree is being removed without, without um, a, a, a permit. Or another presidential situation is sidewalk is getting, getting re replaced and a prune it, a, a prune it, a permit to prune the, 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 the roots of the street tree have not been issued. And then a um, contractor may be cutting a large root of the tree that will lead to the eventual death, death of that tree. The permit is to the, the intent is to stop um, unpermitted activity from um, occurring. Okay, that, that's not what it says. If 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 a tree is a <clears throat> in danger, if a developer or a city agency is going to cut down a tree in violation, that that's 
that's a circumstance where a stop work order may seem warranted. But you, mm -hmm. you talked about enforcement. So there's already been a problem on a site. Uh, cities building a street, it improperly took down some trees. So there's no, under the current code, you'd have to show a danger, a threat of some kind to issue a stop work order. There's probably no danger if the violations already occurred. But now violations occurred, maybe there's a dispute over the violation and you wanna issue a stop work order. I think you're expanding the authority to issue a stop work order beyond what you just said was the intent. Uh, you know, you have reason to believe they're about to take down trees in violation and you want to stop it. That's the sort of emergency. I understand that. But if it's simply a dispute over a prior action, is it enforceable? Was it a violation? I, I don't, I'm not comfortable expanding the leverage in the authority of, of the of the urban forester to issue a stop where I think you need to have your language modified to say what you just said. You're getting rid of the language that said, and remind me the language about threat or danger situation. Maybe you need to put that in and modify it to say, if, if some party is taking down or getting ready to take down a tree impermissibly, then you can stop work. But I, I hate to see an entire project that's underway. Forrester believes there was a tree taken down improperly and you want to stop the whole project. So I-, I, I I, again, I understand you're going to tell me that's not your intent. I, I wish the language reflected your intent better. So, the lang I would just say the, the language, yeah, that is 100% not the intent. And I don't think that's the authority that this code amendment would give us anyway. Um, it's it's specific to violations of this chapter. So it's, it's specific to violations of, of Title 11. So it, it is a stop work order to stop the violation that is occurring. It does not mean that we could stop a building permit from proceeding because a tree was removed on site previously. It is specific so, to the- So specific I'm, to I'm developing a, a subdivision and you guys do an inspection and go, whoa, you took down what tree you weren't supposed to take down. And I go, no, no, look at my blueprints. I, I was allowed to take that down. And we have an argument. We have a dispute whether a tree I've taken down was permitted to be taken down or not. Can you issue what 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 would your stop work order authority be? It looks like it says violation of Title Eleven in your opinion. What are you stopping work on if you have stop work authority? the The language of the code is when any work is being conducted in violation of this title, the city forester BDS director may issue a stop work order as stated in the requirements of the section. That that is specific to a violation of Title Eleven is is occurring and the scenario that we're really talking about is like we were saying with tree if a, if a crew is taking down a tree that has not been permitted for removal this gives the city forester the authority to issue that stop 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 work work order so if the trees already that you're just the trees already come down you can't stop work on the project no because then because because if there's work being done to build a triplex that tribe, the that that isn't the violation. It's the actual violation of removing the tree. Okay. And one other issue that came up last time, and I and I see you didn't agree with my perspective on it, is I think it's number eight. This is an appeal hearing. Urban Forester denies someone's you know, desire to take down trees. They file an appeal, they go to an appeal hearing and you won't allow them to introduce new evidence at the hearing. Standard land use procedures would allow that. And I don't see any reason why an appeal of a, of a denied forestry permit should be any different. I think you should be allowed to present new evidence at the hearing. And I, I wish you had made that change. And I'm I, I, not sure, I guess you just thought about it and decided not to, but I, 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 this is just a small piece of restrictive procedure to impose on, on whether it's a city agency or a private property owner. So I, I'm gonna argue a proposed amendment that, that that be stricken and that an appellant can present evidence at a hearing as a standard procedure in most land use procedures. Yeah, and that, that, did, that did come up um, when we met with the Urban Forestry Commission as, as well. And just, just, for, um, just to clarify for um, everyone else, um, the appellants, when they, this is when they are um, 
appealing a decision made on a tree permit. Um, when they submit their appeal, they're welcome to provide all information. The, the, point, the, the code change simply says at the actual appeal hearing, information that was not submitted at the original, original appeal can't be brought up. And that's simply because the appeals board hasn't had time to look at it or unfortunately hasn't had time to look at it. That information may have led or unfortunately to change the original decision that we that we made. But if it's brought up at the actual appeal, no one's had time to look at it. So it's simply it's simply a process issue to try and uh, discourage that from happening. So someone appears at the hearing, whether it's a member of your staff or whether it's a third party, and and presents it a new argument, new evidence. The appellants out of luck; they can't respond to that new argument. Uh, I, I just think it's a restriction that's for the convenience of urban forestry, not for the convenience of the public. And it's contrary to standard land use procedure. I think you're making a mistake by doing that. So anyway, I, I've probably beat this one to death. So thank you, Brian. No, I, I appreciate it. And honestly, you know, the urban forestry of, of appeals board is staffed by urban forestry commissioners who are, who are volunteers and, um, you know, we, we try, try to keep the hearings as structured and predictable as we can and give them all the information that they, they, they will need prior to the hearing. So that's, that's just really what we're trying to do. Got it. So, thanks. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you, Thank you Jeff, for those. Um, and Brian and Nick, did I under hear you correctly? I'm sorry, I was gone for a few seconds that, um, um, that the Urban Forestry Commission had also had some comments on on amendment eight they asked for might a clarification on it because they they had the same concern that jeff had which meant they that you can't present any new information as part of the entire appeal and we clarified no it's, it's simply that at the appeal hearing okay and and uh was there further discussion after uh, no they were, they were supportive of it then yeah okay. thank you eli um Back to the stop work order question, Brian. When you just read that, it's not what I was reading. Is is the is the document that is duly attached to us? Is that the um, original code red lined to be the proposed changes? Sorry, I I I left out the end public health or safety. Yeah, because that's kind of like the key thing. So if you take minutes, if I could read this out. Just the, here's yeah. what the stop work order clause says right now. And take today's code to Jeff, your question. Stop work orders. When any work is being conducted in violation of this title and public and public health or safety is threatened, then the city forester or BDS can issue a stop work order. So right now you have to meet a two-part test to do a stop work order. One, you have to have a violation of this title. Two, sorry about that finger, you have to have a public health or late or safety is threatened. Okay. What's being proposed in the original language is that it's and or which is totally problematic. I think we all agree on that one because you don't want to say that all it takes is a public health issue to be able to do a stop work order. Um, the question we have is whether, um, so there's two ways to solve it. One way to solve it is, is just leave it as is, and you have to have both a violation of Title um, 11 and you have to have public health or safety to get a stop work order. The other option is to say, all it takes is a violation of this title and you just get rid of the public safety or health as a criteria. So I think those are the choices we have. Yes. Um, I think that um, I don't know the standards for stop work orders. Thank goodness I've never had one. But um, I think that my inclination is to say there probably ought to also be a public health or safety issue to trigger a stop work order, not just a code violation. Because just a code violation in itself could be a matter of dispute, you know, and, and it maybe it's a very minor code violation. Um, I think I'd want there to be a higher hurdle than that. So I'm inclined to um, do an amendment that would say that um, any when any work is being conducted a violation of this title, basically keep it like it is. You both have to have a violation of Title 11 and you have to have a public health or safety threat before you have the authority to stop work order. So someone can try and argue that one, but my inclination is probably not to do this amendment, just leave the current language. Oh, well, we're not to game, so I'll make an amendment proposal that um, we, strip off changes to the stop work order code change and leave that leave that language as existing. Is that the way we should think about this stuff? Is that the assumption is that everything's bundled in and any amendments is to change change that bundle? 
thank you for that question. That was actually going to be my next question. <laughs> how how we would like to um, proceed because the the hope is a recommendation by the end of this. And also, I guess I'll also point of more information. When is our next topic supposed to begin? Because I don't want to. Six forty five. Okay. Um, well, I guess I would make a motion to strip out the um, to strip out the change to the work order requirement um, so that it remains in current as is in current code. And my argument is that um, stop work order is a pretty significant intervention in a construction project, um, and I think that it. Um, a violation of Title 11 is bad, and there's, there's remedies for that, but we should use those other remedies. If there's a violation and there's a public health and safety issue also, then stop work by all means. And I think that's what the current code does. And I'll, I'll second that with a question. So Eli, basically you're saying delete, I believe 32, stay I, with- I so couldn't follow the number, but if that's the right number, that's what I mean, yes. Okay, so and just to clarify, so we're saying stay with what's in the code, and we don't believe there's a reason to change the code. Okay, I, I yes, I second Eliza. Okay, and and to to be clear, we are we are discussing um, Amendment Thirty Two. Uh, we are not discussing uh, at this point moving the entire package with that one change. Correct. Right, just that one amendment, and maybe other amendments, but that's the amendment Great. we're looking at right now. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So that's the first and the second. Um, any uh, further discussion, Brian? Please. Yeah, I don't want to. If there's, I don't want to get ahead of the member of the PSC. If they, okay. Um, I would just note that this would leave if there's a scenario where a neighbor is taking down a large, healthy tree in their backyard that would otherwise not be permitted for re removal. Um, that tree may be able to be taken down in a way that the action of removing it doesn't pose a public health issue. Um, it would leave, or unfortunately, with no options for stopping that tree from coming down. Um, we could issue a, a fine after the fact. Um, I just want to be clear on what the impact here is. Um, I think that there, there. Uh, yeah, I just I just want to be clear on on that because that that that's basically the impact here. Okay. Thank you. I'll say I think that's a fair point. Um, I don't know. I, I would be open to a staff remedy that's not as expansive as what has been proposed in this code update because because I, I can see situations where that makes sense. Um, but as proposed, the language is really quite broad. You know, it, it's just any kind of a public health or safety. Um, um, actually, the current language is and or. So I, I think at this point, any any violation of Title Eleven, even you no know, violating a pruning permit, would be um, eligible for a stop work order. So I guess I would hope I, I would be interested if staff has a has another way of writing this. So yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I was going to add, would it? If I'm interested, if it would you know address some of these concerns if we were to work um, you know with the Bureau of Development Services, but also um, maybe our city attorney's office. Um, because I'm the way that I'm reading it is that it is specific to the action that is violating Title 11. It does not mean that a development project would stop. And actually, I'm almost certain that's not at all the authority we would have here. Um, but if that's the real concern, um, we we could absolutely work to, on on the if the PSC's recommendation could be um, to to work with that language to be clear that it is. The activity that is violating Title 11 that needs to stop the specific tree work, um, not say a larger development project. Because again, I, I really don't, that hasn't even come up in these conversations with BDS or BPS about that being an eventuality that could take place from this. But um, we could definitely take a closer look at it to be clear that that is not the authority being, being um, um, assumed here. Eli, thoughts? Oh, that would help me a lot. I mean, I, I assume stop work order means you stop work on the job site. That's the way I interpret it. So if I'm interpreting that incorrectly, then um, um, I guess if your proposal is that to only stop the, if you if basically you're saying, I, I don't even know if this exists. Are you able to just stop tree work? Um, 
if you violate um, a Title 11 code thing, then I guess I'd be okay with that without having a public safety thing. But I, I guess I need to understand that that actually works with a code. I don't, I, my I have a very loose understanding of what a stop work order is. And usually it means that who cares whether the other work on the job site is being legal, you're stopped. So I could be wrong on that, but that's the way I think of it. Yeah, and and again, the the way that we saw this playing out was almost exclusively within these sort of non-development situations where a tree is being removed. We know there's not a permit. Um, we don't have a lot of options right now to stop that from from from, from happening. But um, yeah, it, this this is this is the process that helps where we are able to look at oh well, here's here's another way that could be interpreted. That's not the um, that's not the intent that we have. Um, and we can definitely go back with staff and work on how can we tighten to tighten this up a little bit. Is that does that I just want to uh, ask a process question before going to you, Valeria, um, uh, Eli, and Jeff? Would that satisfy the? Would that work within the amendment? Um, you have a question. I don't know how to write it. I mean, I think that yeah. I understand the intent. Um, but if the idea is for us to vote this out of here today, then I don't see us getting there. So I guess I'm going to keep that amendment on the table and, and welcome an you know staff to come up with something for city. If they need to keep the schedule going, um, I would still propose the amendment because I don't think what's on the table right now, I think what's on the table is too expansive. Um, and then if staff wants to you know, bring an amendment to city council, then that would be one way to um, remedy it there. Perhaps if worse comes to worse, uh, we could include, uh, um, as as is our want sometimes to include with a transmittal letter, um, the intent to be like, we knew that there was a timeline. We have done this very recently uh, for it too, <laughs> of you know that there was a really quick timeline. Um, we and this was this is our hope and to to kick it back with assurance to, uh, about staffs. Uh, ability and uh, to remedy. Does that, would that satisfy Brian and Nick? I think, I think that would work for us. Yeah, I don't, I don't okay. know when your next meeting is, if we could potentially come back with okay. revised language, um, but I don't, I don't know what you have on the um, agenda coming up. I don't want to push anything I'm out. Seeing, I'm seeing a head shake from Patricia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But let's uh, let's continue. See how far we get, uh, right. Valeria. Yeah. Um, actually, I I personally think I would feel more comfortable if we come back with that language. If you can come back with that language, um, just given what you raised, Brian, I feel like again looking out for unintended consequences and how people might interpret it. And I really appreciate Eli that you bring um, also quite a different interpretation and perspective on these things. But um, just given what Brian raised, raised up and just, again, with a focus, we're trying to do as much as we can with these amendments to continue to preserve our um, tree canopy, I wouldn't feel comfortable uh, approving that or are we, or seconding, or are we approving right now? Um, we're we, we're in the proposed amend amendment, I think I would rather have staff drafted and vote on that personally. Okay, great. Oriana? I just wanna agree with Valeria on that. I think that this is a big enough issue with unintended consequences potentially in both directions that I both don't feel comfortable saying, let's move it along or see it, say we support this and see it get amended and given to council and then the language doesn't like, look in a way that we might support, but vice versa, just voting it out today uh, could have unintended consequences. And I think I need some more information. And I just want to acknowledge that that puts staff in a difficult position and a lot of potential work, both to get this into our next agenda, to stay on the schedule and also to do the work. So I want to be conscious of that. I think my inclination is to trust staff's judgment and vote it out today if that is not possible. Um, so just want to be conscious of staff's capacity as well, and just both in the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability side and managing this body, and then also um, in the urban forestry side. Uh, 
Um, I do see in our uh, on the PSC, I was looking at tentative agendas that we do have on June 14th, a statement of uh, Title 11 amendments of work session and recommendation. Is that, um, is that a separate process or is that updated or? Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I think that actually was the original plan. And then when we had the PSC officers meeting, the hope was that we could do both today. But um, yeah, if it, if it works with your timeline, it gives us um, a few weeks to come up with um, something that responds to the concerns here. Sure. I'm sorry, um, this is Patricia for the record. Um, oh, Dondi, did you, did you want to jump in here? I, I was just going to say the date, I think the issue is that there's, pretty heavy work program uh, or you know agenda stacking up um, on the tentative agenda. For example, the next meeting, there's a um, the West Portland Town Center and it's a recommendation. So that I imagine that's going to take, you know, it's it's I think on purpose, just one item on the agenda for that meeting because it's likely to engender a lot of discussion. So um, just want to kind of and I, I forget what meeting was it originally slated for? I'm sorry, uh, did you say that stuff? I said, yeah, I said June 14th was on the, yeah. the website. So I think I think that's part of the issue is just wanting to keep that agenda light for that very, uh, you know, important and kind of hefty conversation. Um, and I don't fully know the timeline for the parks folks. So just want to kind of keep that in mind. All right. <clears throat> As a thought. Just try to move us. If we, if there are a few, um, if we can identify um, the the very few. It sounds like we have um, thoughts or questions about a very few amendments. Um, we can uh, green light everything that isn't that doesn't uh, beg for potential tweaks um, with that, uh, and then come for a, a pretty quick. Uh, poll into to mid June. I'm I'm looking at at Brian, Nick, Patricia. Maybe um, pardon. Um, if I could just suggest, if there's anything where you could give us guidance on how you'd like the change to be made, and then you know, I think yeah, I think that's what we're it. yeah, I think that's what we're doing, right? Um, and yeah, so I'm just with that. Satisfy. Brian and Nick, it would that to... work for you? Yeah. But, but you were suggesting that it would still come back, it would still be agendized again, stuff on this. I, I think if the if BSC is comfortable um, making a recommendation that is supportive of the amendments, um, with the exceptions of um, addressing the issue around the stop work order, to make it clear that that is specific to violations of Title 11 and the the actual work that is in violation of Title 11, um, I think that would be great for us. Yeah, great. As long as that addresses the PSC's uh, c c concerns too. Thank you all for working on this. Uh, is there anything, any strong objection to that? Move forward. Okay, let's try to kids. So we are, um, we are, we are discussing thirty-two, but we, I feel like we have um, a path forward. Jeff, uh, I was going to move on to just two others, but I, I'm, well, I'm we have sure. to vote. We have a, we have something we'll on the vote. table. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Are we? Are we voting? Um, well, I mean, it is it is your end, Elias. Yeah, I'm 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 sorry, I'm confused. I, I think that I know my I I I think that number thirty two could be resolved very easily as a consent item at our next meeting if we just give staff a chance to write something up because Title Eleven violations vary from pruning to cutting down a four foot tree and they just in this first version didn't differentiate or development of situations or not. So I think this is not a good use of our time right now if we can avoid it okay. to try and wordsmith that for them. Um, so, but I I. I guess it's my my inclination is to say yes. We have a busy meeting coming up, but I think that between now and then we could have this be a consent item and just do it in like less than five minutes of that meeting, um, for this topic at least. So maybe I guess with that said, um, if um, I think it's probably more of, if if we have that option as an outlet, someone tell me if we don't, then my preference is to withdraw this amendment, knowing that I'm not voting on this tonight, um, the whole package, 
and then let's just flag any other things that we want to discuss, and then we have a, um, and, and then we we bring it to the group baked to have a quick vote at a next meeting. That's my preference if that can work. Commissioners, this is Patricia. I mean, I think we can make that work if to have a hopefully a, a briefer kind of uh, discussion on, at the next meeting, we can we can make that work. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, uh, Eli was suggesting consent, which I think is a great one. Well, there would be basically zero and conversation in between. Great. Brian and Nick, do you have enough? Uh, do you have enough um, guidance or, or thoughts to to move forward? I think, um, and I, I don't want to drag on this conversation. I just want to be clear on what um, is sort of being asked of us as we walk away from here. Um, the the, I, the 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 main concern I heard was that a violation of Title Eleven could that this would give the city forester or even the uh, Bureau of Development Services director um, the authority to stop a development project, an entire development project, because of a, a um, violation of Title Eleven. Um, that that's not the intent that we had, and that's that's the main issue that um, we are planning to work on. I do want to clarify though that, um, like Eli mentioned, potentially pruning a tree. Um, pruning Im improper hazardous pruning can lead to the death of a tree. And so um, we would, uh, I, I would not want to amend this to not allow us to issue a stop work order if trees being pruned. And I raise that just because Eli, that was the example that you gave and I want to be sure that um, what we bring back if it's going to be consent item is matching the expectations that you have. And um, pruning can be a pretty serious violation that can um, cause harm. Sure. So I, I'm willing to be part of a chat group in between meetings okay. if that's helpful, just to try and get some language. Yeah. In. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Anything else before we move on? Thank you all. Memo oh. withdrawn. Okay, Jeff. Okay. I have two two amendments, both of which I don't think are subject to wordsmithing. I, I'm just going to. Um, propose they be deleted entirely. I'll do them one at a time. The first is the one we just did about not allowing new evidence at an appeal hearing. I think I already explained why I think that's wrong. What can happen, and I, I've never been in a forestry appeal hearing, but I've been in hundreds of other appeal hearings. The appellant introduces new evidence before the hearing. Appellant gets to the hearing and staff's got a response. Staff responds to that new evidence maybe submits new arguments, maybe it counters it. And so what you're saying is now I'm the appellant, staff has countered my new evidence, but I can't introduce any new evidence. I think that's the reason why land use procedure would not allow that to happen. Land use procedure always allows the appellant the last shot at argument and evidence. So again, I, I propose we delete number eight, which restricts new evidence at a hearing. And I would make the further comment, that's not a technical amendment. That's a substantive change to procedure so those are two reasons I don't think it belongs in this package. So that's my amendment. Remove number eight. Thank you, Jeff. Um, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, Eli seconds. Um, thoughts, comments, discussion? Oriana? I just want to confirm this is a concern that the Urban Forestry Commission raised as well. Am I understanding that correctly? No, they they asked for clear uh, clear cl clarification on it, and just to be clear, it's not a situation where no no new evidence. So it's not that staff could bring new evidence and trap the the the, the, the appellant and they can't can't respond. It's simply that all the information needs to be included in the original um, appeal. So the UFC asked for clarification on it, but the UFC has supported all the um, all the code amendments as as uh, as pr as pr pr proposed. But, but Brian, if, if an appellant introduces new evidence after the decision, before the hearing, so they submit written evidence, wouldn't staff respond to that written evidence? Wouldn't they have comments about that new written evidence? Or are they just going to sit silent? Let me answer. Of course they're going to respond to the new evidence, um, which puts the appellant in a... In a a less than favorable condition. So anyway, I, I guess we've probably, like all these issues, these technical amendments, we've probably spent an awful lot of time on them. So uh, we have a motion. Uh, Valeria? Yeah. 
Um, so, Brian, just to confirm, they um, the commission requested that clarification. We haven't seen that yet. It, but it, it, is that a line with what Jeff is proposing as an amendment? The or it's just hard for me to understand if I'm voting. Like we haven't seen what staff has come up with. Oh, yeah. sorry. No, we um, the UFC asked for clarification about can new information be provided when oh, the appeal is submitted, okay. or like, and the clarification was yes, they can. That is. Um, okay. That is what is allowed. So there is no language being changed. Okay. Okay. I understand now. Yeah. Sorry. It's like, okay. Yeah. Jesse. Yeah. I'm just curious if this has happened before where you've had someone introduce new evidence and it's just created like chaos on the commission or like what's kind of like the reasoning for this? Yeah, it has. It, it's, it's been a few years. It's been quite. I mean, we only only about two or three of these appeal hearings a year to take to take place. It's probably I'm trying to remember maybe three or four years ago. But um, it might be that a uh, like a great example is the tree was they requested to be removed and the condition of the tree did not warrant re removal. But then at the appeal hearing, um, maybe photos of prior failures or something like that. That were never included in the permit application, were never included in the appeal information. And then um, the city forester has not had time to review this new information about the condition of the tree. Um, and, and then the appeals board is faced with um, sort of un, uncertain of how to respond to that. And so um, then this is really for the appeals board um, to be able to manage their process better. And just a real quick follow-up question. I'm not super familiar with this appeals board and you said it was just like a group of volunteers. So is this something just like workload? It's very concerning that like they're gonna have to deal with that down the line. Yeah, and it's, they, um, it's the appeals board is made up of five members of the urban forestry uh, commission. So they, they hold their appeals at the end of urban forestry meet meetings. Um, and if there's an issue with that appeal, they don't meet again for another month. So if new information is brought up, um, that essentially means that they then need to stop the hearing or push the hearing until the next 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 month. So, just then as a note, real quick, I can imagine that's really difficult. Even like on the PSC, if we were having a meeting and then all of a sudden we were having all this new stuff, and it takes new staff yeah. um, time and energy to go back to that. So I don't know if I would then be supportive of this amendment. Thank you, uh, Nick. And then I just wanted to also note, we uh, technically have four minutes left for this, uh, this agenda. Just very quickly adding that um, part of the intent is so that the appeals board can make a careful consideration, careful decision. Um, it is um, for process, but also for the benefit of the uh, appellant. So if new Thank information- you was introduced, then I think, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, but a different date could be set, right? Or a new um, application would have to be, a new application for an appeal would have to be filed, right? Uh, not a new application, the current one would stand, but they would just push the hearing back up um, to the next month. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, so we have a um, that amendment. Uh, JP, could you kindly call the roll? Sure, I can call the roll. So, um, Commissioner Spivak. Um, yes. Commissioner Magnera. No. Commissioner Backrack. Yes. Commissioner Larcel. So I'm so embarrassed, but what are we voting on exactly? There was so much discussion. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm embarrassed, we're... but I don't know what I'm voting on and I'm not going to do it. Oh, I perhaps should, should have clarified. It is uh, removal. Uh, we're uh, 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 removing Amendment 8, which is to restrict, restrict new information being submitted and an appeal. Okay, hearing. that one. All right. Um, let's see. So yes would take it away. No would do... Yes, would take it away, so we wouldn't. We wouldn't. Okay, so I'm going to vote no against it on it. Okay, uh, Commissioner Gittemeyer. Um, no. Commissioner McWilliams. No. 
And Commissioner Bell? No. Okay, so the motion does not. I also vote no. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. It's all good. Still doesn't pass. But still doesn't pass. <laughs> okay, um, I want to move us uh, relatively quickly. So we are, we had some conversations around uh, Amendment 29. Jeff, did you have? Yeah, I, I was going to make a motion to delete Amendment 29, which is the provision that expands the definition of danger tree. So I move. Again, we discussed the reasoning, and again, it's it's more than a technical amendment. So I move the deletion of number 29. Okay. Uh, Jeff moves. Uh, is there a second? I have a question. I'm wondering if this could be similar to the other amendment where the concerns and the language could be modified, um, because I think the, the concern that Brian raised before is still valid and would be great to keep that rather than just remove it. Okay. I thought too. Would that be acceptable, Jeff? You had made a motion. Uh, and... Well, if I don't have a second, it, <laughs> it doesn't matter what's acceptable to me. My motion That's true. Will, will die uh, again. I I I think it's late in the game to start wordsmithing. Expanding the definition of approval criteria is not a technical amendment. It's a substantive amendment. It may be a small substantive amendment, but uh, I am always uncomfortable when we call something a technical package and then include a series of small substantive changes. So, so I, I'm going to stand by my motion and if it dies, so be it. And, and if other people want to propose wordsmithing, uh, that's certainly their prerogative. Okay. Uh, so there's a motion on the table. Is there a second? I guess I'll withdraw my motion. Oh. <laughs> and I, and I will, you, now that it's withdrawn, I will volunteer to try and help wordsmith this if it helps between meetings. Because I think that the current language is too broad. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to have something to get towards consent at our next meeting. Great. And if, um, I, I would love to, if uh, with the, uh, with the threat of being impertinent, uh, Valeria, you had also had a couple of substantive comments if, if desired, could they call on you? Great, thank you. Uh, Please do, thanks. Great. Uh, 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 Brian, Nick, is that enough to move forward that we can bring it back? Yeah, I think so. So we'll, um, okay. yeah, we'll reach out and uh, work on some of the language. Great, I would love to make a motion. I hope it's not because we are at six or six uh, and we have, a doozy of a project to talk next, uh, but I don't want to give this short shrift. I, I would love to make a motion, that's not improper, uh, to uh, minus uh, the uh, uh, modifications to amendments eight and 29 um, that we can accept the rest of uh, the summary of Title 11 amendments before us. Would there be a second? I'll second that. Okay, Mariana. Commissioners, uh, Patricia Diefenderfer, um, just to clarify your motion, um, this should be a recommendation to approve these to, staff, uh, to, to the city council because there are um, amendments to those sections that we described, um, 11.5, six and seven. So just wanna make sure that your motion is for that specifically. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not understanding. You, right now you're moving to, uh, the motion is to essentially approve these amendments, except for the ones that are going to get wordsmithed, right? That's correct. So I'm just suggesting that we could clarify that it, it's um, a formal recommendation to council to approve these amendments because it, these amendments include amendments to those sections for which the code says the PSC has, you know, that more formal action. So just clarifying the motion that it's a recommendation to, for council to approve the amendments, these proposed amendments. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a second uh, discussion. 
Okay, great. JP, could you call the roll? Thank you. I will. Uh, so, Chair Ralph. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Spivak. I, I think I'm understanding this right. We're we're basically voting through the package except for the parts that we're waiting on. Okay. That is correct. Every, the entire package we are looking to approve except for amendments eight and 29, which will be uh, work grouped and brought before to consent at a, at a near term PSC meeting. I don't think it's eight. I thought it was, or is it eight? Oh, I'm so sorry. No, uh, uh, 2932, thank you. Right, oh, thank you. Oof. Okay. What a, what a yes, day. Yes, I'll support that. Okay. Yes, I. So we have Ralph Spivak, uh, Commissioner Backrack. Uh, I'm, I'm going to vote no. Uh, there's we've got uncertain pieces, and I think as a whole, the package just goes too far beyond technical into substantive changes. So I'm not going to support it. All right, uh, Commissioner Gittemeyer. Yes. Commissioner Bell. Yes. Commissioner Larcel. Yes. Commissioner Magnera. Yes. Commissioner McWilliams. Yes. Okay, I didn't miss anybody. No, okay. Uh, the motion passes. Ooh. Quick celebration team. <laughs> Ooh, well done. <laughs> Thank you for everyone's forbearance, your passion, your enthusiasm, your forbearance. Um, Nick and Brian, thank you so much. We hope that you will come back. Of course. <laughs> okay. This has been great discussion. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate you. And uh, on to the next discussion. Where even are we in great? Uh, the Interstate Bridge Replacement Project. And uh, there's a, we have a, a covey of folks who have been waiting patiently, uh, including, but not limited to, Patrick Sweeney uh, and Caitlin Reff. And um, in uh, prior, as at the beginning, uh, I'd love to invite any potential conflicts of interest or disclosures. Uh, I have one um, on this project that I am uh, I am representing uh, Sightline Institute uh, on a related group, which is the Just Crossing Alliance. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, this is uh, John L. I, I also have uh, a conflict of interest. I, my firm, as Council Strategies, is on uh, contract with uh, the Interstate Bridge Replacement Program, and therefore I am going to um, withdraw myself from participating in this discussion. Oh, we will miss you and hope that that briefly uh, look into where you are means that you're in some place leafy and beautiful. Anyone else? Thank you, Commissioner Bell. Okay, Oriana? Are these, I stepped away for a second, are these disclosures for i Bridge? That's correct. Um, my organization is advocating around this particular issue. I am not personally involved in it from work perspective, but just want to be transparent that uh, Verde has a position. Jeff, is that a new or an old hand? Oh, it's an old hand. My apologies. Okay, great. Oh, thank you. Okay, and with that, Patrick, Caitlin, and company. What? Pardon me, uh, Chair. This is Patricia Diefenderfer. There, I do want to make a few introductory remarks. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm um, so sorry. Please. No worries. No worries okay. at all. I'm going to make a few introductory remarks for this um, item and then kick it over to Patrick and Caitlin and, and others who will be making the formal presentation. Thank you so much. So just want to uh, kind of frame for us a little bit. This second item is a, a briefing, as, as the commission knows, on the interstate bridge replacement project. Um, it'll be uh, presented by the staff working on the interstate bridge replacement program and uh, staff from PBOT. As previously noted, um, no formal action is noted on the um, agenda. No formal action or recommendation on the part of the PSC is required. 
This project, as, as many of you know, is um, involves the construction of the bridge to bring it into conformance with seismic uh, requirements. It, it is proposed as a multimodal bridge to replace the existing 120-year-old bridge, the I-5 bridge that exists currently. Um, and cr that crosses the Columbia River and connects Portland to Washington, of course. Um, the briefing will provide an overview of the intergovernmental staff efforts that have gone into developing this modified locally preferred alternative, which you'll hear more about. It reflects the consensus of eight partner agencies in both Oregon and Washington, including the city of Portland. And it does um, incorporate input from community stakeholders and the input of an inter-bureau uh, coordination that has been occurring on this project and you'll hear much more about that. Um, so the this uh, briefing is part of the project's team's overall outreach process. They've been um, updating uh, several city commissions and advisory committees um, in advance of an anticipated July date at city council to vote on the modified LPA or uh, locally preferred alternative. Um, just by way of some background, this project advances numerous comp plan goals and policies and fulfills a number of the projects identified in the comprehensive plans transportation system plan project list, which was approved as part of the comprehensive plan um, and adopted in 2016. So those projects include um, the Columbia River Crossing, uh, the Portland Vancouver Light Rail, North Hayden Island uh, Drive Ped and Bike Improvements, the Hayden Island Local Bridge and phases one and two of the envisioned Hayden Island Street Network improvements. So this project kind of in, incorporates uh, elements that, that fulfill um, all of those different projects that are on the list. Um, most recently, city staff have actively been giving input to the project over the last year and have been working to ensure major design, design or I should say alternative decisions to this alternative are consistent with a number of broad planning principles, including goals for multimodal transfer, uh, transit infrastructure and keeping in mind uh, sustainability and equity goals. Uh, some of the more significant decisions uh, which the presentation will cover include decisions about um, the transit mode, the active transportation facilities, or this is the input that was given that has shaped this um, alternative is um, the, the way in which transit, the, the transit modes that are being accommodated, the active transportation facilities, the interchange design and the number of lanes and the footprint of the overall structure, particularly on Hidden Island. So, uh, you know, input has been given on, and that has helped to shape those elements of the, of the alternative. Staff will provide an overview of this process and will highlight the public outreach and engagement that has been conducted with neighborhood associations and other stakeholder groups. In the presentation, staff will also explain what this current step in the project means and outline next steps, including what future phases of this project will involve. And so just a note about the action that um, city council might take um, in July on the modified alternative, that action would um, al just allow this alternative to go uh, proceed to additional environmental review. Um, and it, it is not meant to uh, essentially constitute full design of the project. Design of the bridge um, will occur in later phases of the project and there will be future opportunities to provide input on, on that and for the public to provide input on the design. So just wanted to offer those few remarks to try to frame um, this discussion. And then, so now I wanna go ahead and kick it over to Patrick Sweeney of PBOT and, and Patrick, I'll let you introduce the rest of the team as appropriate, if you don't mind. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you, Patricia. Um, <clears throat> uh, good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Patrick Sweeney. I'm a PBOT Capital Project Manager in the PBOT Major Projects and Partnerships Group. Uh, good to see you all again. Um, so this will be the first time this commission uh, has been briefed on the IBR program. Um, although I think many of you remember uh, the, the previous effort, the Columbia River Crossing. So the IBR team, I'll introduce them in a second. Uh, they're here to provide you with a briefing, as Patricia mentioned, on the recommended modified locally preferred alternative. And um, I am a person who lives with acronyms, so I 
everyone is going to call that LPA. So LPA, you'll hear numerous people say it, it's locally preferred alternative. Uh, but this is there's a little nuance here. This is a modified locally preferred alternative. The IBR folks, they can explain that nuance. Um, <clears throat> so they're going to tell you all about the modified LPA. Um, you should know that um, on as recently as uh, May 10th, City Council had a work session with the IBR program, where uh, and that was recorded if you all want to go watch it. Um, Lots of great information was shared, and also uh, it was there that Commissioner Hardesty clearly articulated the city's position, uh, described how we have been participating as staff over the past couple of years, uh, up to date, and what our priorities are going forward. Uh, the mayor and other council members also shared their concerns and questions with the intent of having those uh, concerns and questions adequately responded to prior to this modified LPA resolution, and that's on July, it's scheduled for July 6th. So briefing you in the back, Bicycle Advisory Committee, the Pedestrian Advisory Committee, Historic Landmarks, Design Commission, Freight Committee, this is all part of uh, informing um, commissions and committees like yourselves that help inform uh, City Council. So uh, overall, we're encouraged uh, by IBR's responsiveness to our feedback and, for, uh, and desired outcomes for the project uh, and the executive steering group that Commissioner Hardesty participates in um, has supported advancing this modified LPA up to this point. But this is a moment when it's important for the IBR team uh, and quite frankly us as staff uh, to hear from all of you. So in the coming weeks, we'll be continuing to work with the IBR team uh, on additional commitments or specific conditions of approval that may be necessary uh, for council to consider along with this modified LPA decision. So once you hear the overview from the IBR team, we're looking forward to your questions and discussion, not only on the uh, progress that's been made to get us to this LPA recommendation, but what challenges and opportunities you'd like to ensure we're tracking uh, in the phases that are coming up ahead. So. I am joined with Caitlin Ruff. Uh, she's the PBOT uh, manager of the major project and partnerships group. And also uh, Shane Valley, he's a transportation planner uh, and our um, equity and climate specialist uh, on our team. He's been tracking with those issues. We'll be available following the IBR presentation. We're listening to all the comments, we're taking notes. We'll help answer any questions if you have any for the staff perspective, but I think this is mostly the IBR show. Um, so thank you very much for your time. And I'd like to pass it over to uh, Ray, Ray maybe with uh, the IBR team. All right, find my mute button. Uh, good evening, uh, uh, Chair Routh and commissioners. Happy to be here tonight with uh, Jake. I'm Ray Maybe, uh, the Assistant Program Administrator for the Interstate Bridge Replacement Program. Um, there's actually two of us, one representing Washington DOT, one Oregon. I'm representing the Oregon DOT on the IBR team. Um, we're going to go through an update uh, for you, uh, a little bit of background, and then talk about the, the acronym, the LPA, what that is and what it isn't, uh, and, then, and then move into some of our um, advisory groups uh, and our climate and equity-centered approach. So let's see, can we bring the presentation up? Excellent, thank you. Okay. So as, as was already framed, um, you know, we're here to provide you an update uh, for the program. Um, uh, you heard about the work session, uh, the upcoming meet, meeting with the uh, city council on July 6th and um, and looking for the concurrence for project partners, their, their boards and councils to take that LPA into the um, supplemental environmental impact statement process. <clears throat> um, and I guess the support that was mentioned earlier was the support from the executives that sit, the pr program principals, the executives of the partner agencies that sit on our executive steering group. That support was to take that recommended um, modified LPA 
through the boards and councils to seek their advice. So that was the support that we received. Um, and tonight, uh, as we make this presentation, happy to answer questions along the way or at the end, uh, but your input, input is welcome. And there is plenty of opportunity for future input as, as was mentioned, I think the, the level of design is minimal here. Actually, I would say one to 2%, so more to come. Next slide, please. I should be able to do with that box of faces. Let's see if you guys are there. Um, so uh, real quick recap, um, recognizing that the, um, the issues that uh, the previous effort of CRC tried to resolve remained unresolved. Uh, both governors got together uh, and signed a memorandum of intent, um, creating um, a bi-state team uh, uh, between WashDOT and ODOT to pick up um, the work and try to resolve those issues uh, that were, were left when um, CRC ended uh, because they didn't receive full construction funding. Um, and so uh, the two states have dedicated uh, at this point $90, $90 million uh, total to progress the program and get us to and through um, the environmental phase. Um, there's been recent action by the Washington legislature this year, it was a short session, but they were able to pass a, a very large revenue package, Move Ahead Washington, that was I think about $16 billion, but it included $1 billion for uh, the Interstate Bridge Replacement Program. So um, that was a great vote of confidence and a, um, a gesture that uh, I think was really important as uh, in the previous effort, Oregon legislature had, had dedicated its funding uh, and then it stopped when the Washington legislature failed to dedicate theirs. So this was a, a very important gesture uh, by the Washington legislature to show their support um, for making us move forward this time. Um, I mentioned that by state, uh, and I haven't yet. One of the things that's changed uh, since the previous effort and we'll be talking about changes because there's been a lot changed in the last 10 plus years. Um, people ask what's changed and how would, you, how would we think this has got momentum now? Well, one of those things that's changed, I think that uh, is very important is the fact that the two legislatures have gotten together and formed a bi-state legislative committee that provides oversight and guidance to the program. It, it is comprised of eight legislators from Oregon and eight from Washington, uh, four each from the, the House and Senate uh, and uh, they convene um, at this point in this, in this period, we're meeting with them monthly. Uh, they're very engaged and their input and guidance is welcome and the um, opportunity for alignment between the legislative bodies uh, is critically important as, as we work this uh, bi-state program. Um, as you look at the list here of the program partners, uh, they're uh, the same partners that were at the table for the previous effort, and we're happy to have them back again. We've got the two transit agencies of TriMet and CTRAN, CTRAN being in, in Vancouver, the Clark County area, uh, the two uh, metropolitan planning organizations of Metro and RTC, the two cities, of course, the two ports, and then rounding out with the two DOTs. Um, the executives or the uh, principals of these groups sit on that executive steering team. We'll be talking about decision making in a bit, but um, their involvement is key uh, in guiding the program. Uh, and not only is the involvement of the principals key, but the involvement of the staff uh, and managers in each of those groups are, are uh, participating in the work daily as we move forward. We've got inter intergovernmental agreements with each of these organizations to bring their staff on um, and, uh, and make sure they're engaged in the work and providing us direct support. Next slide, please. Here's an overview of our program timeline. You can see the prior planning efforts of the uh, uh, Columbia River Crossing, um, and then the program launch, some planning, and, and where we are today, that dash line, we are um, identifying that recommended modified local preferred alternative. Again, I'll get to what that is. That will take us into uh, an environmental process. But it's important to understand where we are today. That prior planning effort um, of CRC did achieve a record decision uh, from uh, FTA, Federal High Administration, uh, based on a, a 
locally preferred alternative that met the purpose and need that was defined and that we're trying to solve today. Um, as we talked to the community and the program partners and the legislature, they all said we didn't want to start over. We want to make sure we uh, extract as much value as possible from that prior effort. And uh, we want to understand what's changed and how to adapt that work to the realities of today. And so the work has been underway to understand what's changed um, uh, in either context, policy, um, uh, land use, um, regulations, uh, even environmental constraints. And look at what this changed and, and design, develop design options and screening to, uh, to move into and develop this what in front of you would be the locally preferred alternative that we're recommending. <clears throat> and we call it modified because it's modifying the previous locally preferred alternative uh, in reaction to those changes. So um, uh, people have asked, well, where are all the other alternatives? They're actually studied in the previous effort uh, and screened. So we are now a supplemental environmental impact statement process where we're taking this um, modified LPA into the supplemental uh, and uh, studying it uh, and further progressing the design so we understand and can quantify the impacts and um, um, avoid, minimize, and mitigate. But we'll continue that work, get a, hopefully get a revised record decision uh, in late 23, early 24, work on some pre-construction activities and design, and assuming we get construction funding, um, uh, being in construction in the later 2025 timeline. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the, um, the previous planning effort and the problems that remained unresolved. Well, these are, 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 are those. Um, there uh, are six problems that need to be addressed by any alternative, and we can't pick and choose. The alternative has to solve every one of these. Um, I'll quickly step through them. Um, safety is an issue in the program area. It's one of the highest accident rate areas in, in the state of Oregon. Um, and we have conditions that exist with narrow lanes, um, no uh, safety shoulders, very poor sight distance from um, uh, the hump and the bridge. We have bridge lifts that uh, slow down and, and have traffic stopped on the interstate, as well as uh, substandard um, interchange ramps um, that contribute to uh, some accidents. We have an impaired freight movement through the corridor. We've got the port of Vancouver and the port of Portland that access the program area either through Marine Drive or Mill Plain Interchange. And they are uh, in the same congested area uh, conditions uh, as other traffic and um, uh, through traffic that's on this, this corridor that's going from Canada to Mexico, uh, have to deal with a stop sign, the only stop sign on the interstate with it, which is bridgeless. Um, which uh, impairs our freight movement. The congestion conditions continue to increase um, with on a, over 143 vehicles crossing in 2019. Uh, they're experiencing increased congested conditions from the previous effort. The previous effort had three to four hours of congested uh, conditions during peak travel times. And in 2019, those conditions were seven to 10 hours. Um, uh, we all know that uh, we live in an earthquake vulnerable area, that uh, the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake is a not if, but when. <clears throat> and so as we look at the, the old bridges and, and the, the, uh, uh, the data the bridges was mentioned, they were definitely not designed for um, uh, the uh, earthquake that we'll experience. Um, and so uh, they are at risk of collapse uh, in the event of a very, very large earthquake. Um, if you're a, if you're a biker and you've been on the bridge, well then um, you're a braver person than me. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the the sidewalk is is uh, very narrow and has the members of the bridge uh, penetrating it. So as you as you uh, approach uh, oncoming traffic on the sidewalk, you have to duck into the kind of the plane of the truss elements, and that's right next to traffic. Um, and so it's definitely not ideal. It doesn't really serve the need. It doesn't connect to um, uh, the path networks on either side of the bridge. So we know that active transportation for those who are walking, biking, and rolling is definitely an issue. And then uh, we have limited public transportation options. We do have um, uh, a uh, express bus service that C-TRAN runs that uh, goes from uh, Vancouver to downtown Portland, but it is um, 
uh, hung up in the same congested conditions as everybody else. Um, but we'll go back, please. Thank you. Uh, but we know, <laughs> not with that one, the need statements. Thank you. Um, we know that actually, uh, as we talk about things that have changed, one of the things that I think we recognize uh, is that values have um, sharpened. Um, we didn't have these, but they've sharpened around climate and equity. And so those are an overlay uh, on top of these need statements that um, provide uh, opportunity for us to center and focus on those areas as we solve these need statements. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you. So uh, I mentioned um, our decision making structure. This shows uh, our different advisor groups uh, that uh, that support uh, the program and help us make sound decisions. Um, you can see in the center that's uh, representing the program or the program administrator, that is Greg Johnson. Uh, while he actually uh, is an ODOT employee, he officially reports to Secretary Millar of WashDOT and Director Strickler. Um, we just need to figure out somebody had to hire him, but uh, he reports to both of those. And it's important for us to have a single program administrator that is representing um, uh, the DOTs uh, that's leading our team. So Greg, if you haven't met him, uh, you know, definitely find the opportunity to. Um, but he and the team are at the center of this, but we're advised by our community advisory group um, that provides our input and feedback uh, to help develop our recommendations. Uh, it really helps us ensure our program outcomes reflect the community needs and issues and concerns. Um, our equity advisory group, which um, is chaired by uh, John Allen, I know he's um, uh, um, stepped back from this meeting right now, but um, uh, he's leading our, our equity advisory group, which uh, we believe is unique for mega projects and a model for others across the country. Um, but as a key group that helps us center equity, it's defined equity for the program. And, and both of these groups have to, to help develop uh, screening criteria uh, to help us evaluate options that have led to the, the uh, recommended modified LPA. Um, so they too provide recommendations to the program regarding our processes and policies and, and decisions. And uh, with a, a real focus on, on um, making sure that we are considering the effect on historically underserved communities and communities of, of color. Um, and so that, uh, and, and BIPOC, I mean, the whole definition, if you look at our definition of, equ of um, equity and, equ and groups, um, it is a, a broad definition. Perhaps uh, Jake can get into that some more. But those, those groups provide direct input into the program, but they also provide input into the executive steering group, those principles that I mentioned earlier. And uh, the executive steering group meets regularly to provide uh, that leadership and guidance. Um, we can't leave out our other decision makers. We've got uh, other federal partners. I mentioned uh, potentially the Federal Transit Administration, the Ohio Administration, or other permitting agencies, uh, uh, the Transportation Commissions of both states, and then and then there is that uh, direct oversight and guidance from the um, uh, uh, by state legislative committee. Next slide, please. Great. So. Um, so IBR is working with all of our partner agencies to understand their, their plans and to find opportunities to support them. And so um, our goal uh, in order to support your climate action plan and the climate emergency declaration is to make sure that our elements are addressing those. So our multimodal options that we're providing, uh, um, uh, active transportation and high capacity transit is there, uh, uh, the variable Price tolling will provide demand management. We have other demand management tools. And we'll be looking at uh, uh, reducing our construction-based emissions and uh, our maintenance operations impacts. Next slide, please. Um, also, again, we wanna be consistent with your city plans. And those are mentioned earlier in the entry, uh, the kind of the intro. Um, and we're working to support those plans through our transit investments um, in high capacity transit. Uh, and uh, bus on shoulder using the um, uh, 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 express bus service, um, our active transportation, like I mentioned before, a network, we'll see that on the LPA, and addressing our congestion, safety, and uh, um, uh, traffic management and congestion issues. 
<clears throat> Next slide, please. So now let's get to the meat of things. Next slide is to talk about that recommended LPA, but I'll take a quick minute to tell you about what that is and what it isn't. It's really um, a term that is for projects that have high capacity transit and, and are entering the process of uh, capital improvement grants with the uh, Federal Transit Administration. So it's a term geared towards that work, but it is a high level um, identification of the foundational components of the program. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, it'll be talking about uh, transit modes, um, basic elements of the program, the highway components, but not details. But what it isn't is a fully defined alternative. Um, it's a conceptual design at this point. It is not final design. There's still a lot of work to do. I said they were at about one or two percent. That's definitely not the end of analysis. We have a lot of work to do through the supplemental and beyond. Uh, and the support of the recommended LPA to go into the uh, uh, supplemental environmental impact statement process is not uh, a final approval of what's what's going to be built. It's what we're taking into the studies. Next slide, please. Great. So here um, uh, is a graphic showing the program area. On the lower left, you'll see Marine Drive. You'll see the full interchange dot there. Uh, and then going north uh, over Hayden Island, a partial interchange over the main river crossing and down into uh, Vancouver. Um, and so the components that we see here that are combining this LPA are, are a partial interchange on Hayden Island. Um, and in this partial interchange developed as a result of the input from the community and our partners and trying to find the right size of project uh, we looked at the land use that was happening um, or not happening on West Hayden Island uh, and the, the desires of the community have uh, access um, uh, access to the island that is not on the interstate system. And so uh, this partial interchange provides access to uh, Vancouver, dire direct access from Vancouver via uh, ramps. So there's a uh, ramp south would act from Vancouver would access the island and then ramps north from the island would access Vancouver. To access North Portland, you would take a local access bridge, which is in gray on the right, and that would then go through and under the Marine Drive interchange then to connect to the interstate. But it also gives you direct access to um, the local roads of MLK and Marine Drive without being on the interstate. I think I saw a hand up. So um yeah uh so. oh hey hi Ray, it's patrick hey um i am just um playing the role of timekeeper and yeah. we're about we're half halfway through the powerpoint and um um i think this meeting's supposed to be over at 7 45 so i just want to make sure that um we if you get, if you can speed it up so we can get to uh comments and questions that'd be great sure sure uh let's take a look here <clears throat> yeah perfect i think um I'll flip it to um, Jake after the slide. So I'll, I'll make a few more comments about these main components and we'll move on to, to Jake. Uh, I mentioned the partial interchange. Um, we also are looking at extending light rail. That's the chosen high capacity transit mode uh, from the Expo Center. That's kind of the yellow line there on the left side of the freeway. Um, and that would extend uh, across the um, North Portland Harbor with a station on Hayden Island. And then um, sharing the highway bridge and then uh, having access down into um, Vancouver with multiple stations. Um, this is different than the previous effort in that um, uh, uh, CTRAN has developed a robust BRT uh, network uh, on the same couplet in downtown Vancouver that we were, uh, CRC was thinking about putting in light rail. Um, since we have that in place now and we don't want to disrupt the city's development and plans, the, uh, the light rail alignment is actually now hugging I-5 as it extends up to Evergreen. So that's a big change. Um, we're also looking at, like I mentioned, right sizing the project. And so uh, to facilitate that uh, ramp to ramp connections and merging and weaving, um, we're looking uh, to study one auxiliary lane that would connect from Marine Drive up to the mill plane um, interchange in each direction. So we've got three through lanes to the north and three to the south. 
and then we'd add those auxiliary lanes uh, across that area. So that's what we're taking to that study. And then lastly, we are um, uh, to uh, help uh, fund the program as well as manage congestion, uh, looking at variable rate tolling uh, to um, to vari variable rate tolling in the program area. And now this is a separate effort from the Oregon tolling program. This is specifically to pay for um, the IVR uh, and and our manager congested conditions. With that, I will flip it to Jake. Thanks, Ryan. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having us. Um, so I'm Jake. I, I'm on the equity team under John L on the project. So I'll go over um, just as quickly as I can how we are trying to center equity and climate throughout the project. Um, one one thing that that has been pretty consistent, um, the leadership has really emphasized is that, uh, and partners have emphasized is that it needs to be a, an equity and climate centered project um, throughout. So maximizing benefits and bur and minimizing burdens for equity priority communities, which we've defined in an equity definition. So we have a project specific de uh, definition that our equity advisory group um, led the charge on developing. I'll, I'll um, talk a little bit more about them in a sec. Um, our community engagement really centers equity. Um, we're supporting statewide goals, um, climate goals for up reduction in GHGs and air quality improvements, um, and then looking at how we can make the, the uh, infrastructure that's built as resilient as possible for to future climate disruptions. So a few things of, of where that um, comes into play, and this is not my area of expertise, so please don't ask me any questions on this. Um, no, Ray, Ray, I'm sure could uh, can answer more, but um, some of those elements of resilient design um, to, to high heat and smoke, as well as storms and flooding. Um, and oh, I see there's a hand. Yeah. Hi, Jake. Hi, this is Valeria McWilliams. Um, just in the previous slide, um, I'm wondering if wealth creation for BIPOC is also um, being considered. I do really appreciate um, everything that's listed as priorities, but I think with such a huge infrastructure uh, project like this, there is so much potential to um, also create wealth um, in terms of you know contracts and things like that. So I just wanted to elevate that. Thank you. Yeah, you're you're exactly right. We we have a set of of equity objectives, and one of them is focused on economic empowerment and economic op opportunities um, and specifically calls out that in workforce and contracting. And that, that is going to be a huge, huge part of the project, um, especially as we go into design and construction. Great. Thank you so much for addressing that. I yeah, appreciate that. Um, so then as, as Ray mentioned, you know, we have high capacity transit element, variable rate tolling, a lot of elements that, that uh, should support climate goals as well as during construction. Um, some strategies to that that we will be using or exploring um, to to meet that commitment. In terms of our equity commitment, we have a, a, a long list of things that we are doing and have done um, to try to 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 honor this. Um, I mentioned uh, that, and it's been mentioned. John L. Bell, uh, the principal equity officer, we have an equity advisory group. Um, trying to be as inclusive and, and equitable in our community engagement, um, again, procurement and contracting. Uh, so, so a variety of, of different things that we're trying to do to, to really put that equity commitment into action. The EAG, there's always an acronym with an advisory group. Um, yeah, they are, they are focused on just exactly that, equity. We, we felt it was, there was a need to have a specific group in addition to a general community advisory group have one really dialed in on on equity, and so um, they they have full, they have they have filled that role uh, really well. Some great smart people on that committee helped, like I said, develop an equity definition. They uh, uh, developed some screening criteria for how we were evaluating these different design options that go into the modified LPA. Um, we've met eighteen times, which is kind of crazy when I. Um, uh, counted that up uh, for this presentation. Um, and going forward, we're going to really be focusing on a community benefits agreement, um, ongoing equity analysis, workforce contracting, um, and community engagement. 
the community advisory group, uh, while equity is certainly a value of that group and, and not just the purview of the EAG, um, they are a, a more broad swath of community members that aren't necessarily just focused uh, as much on equity. By state membership, just like the EAG, um, uh, they've, they've met a couple more times than us. Uh, at the in the EAG, and they're they're really going to be focusing on a bridge aesthetics, um, a variety of of things as the as they come up going forward in the program. And they advise the ex executive steering group. Their recommendations go to to that group. Uh, I know that community engagement is is uh, going to be an important topic for folks on um, this committee. That we've done a lot is a, a big way a, a, a succinct way to put it. Um, between newsletter we have, um, the communications we've done, the meetings we've held, um, working groups, advisory groups, et cetera. Um, I won't, won't go through all of them, but um, we've reached a lot of folks, heard from a lot of folks, um, and both, both from the broad community as well as some really intentional um, engagement of folks from, from equity priority communities. Uh, we held listening sessions that I'll... I'll um, walk through real, real quick um, that, that speaks to that. Um, uh, Jake, could I, yeah. um, I'd like to just, because we are at 7.30, um, uh, we're looking at 15 minutes so far. I'm wondering if we would lose quorum if we went to eight. With apologies. Okay, right. please continue. And I'll, I'll wrap this up quick. Great. I believe you guys have, have the slides um, and can look or, or we can share them with you um, and can see these details um, written out on the slides. Um, but we held listening sessions and, and engagement, um, of course, with tribal nations as a government to government relationship there. Um, we had a couple listening sessions specifically focused and in including BIPOC folks um, to hear perspectives of um, some, some members of that community. Um, we have engaged people with disabilities um, to hear their perspective, um, youth and people living with lower income, as well as limited English proficiency folks. We've held listening sessions in multiple languages. Um, and, and these are consistent with communities that we've listed out in our equity definition. Um, and it's been, those, those have been really rewarding um, events to be a part of and, and actually hear uh, folks who uh, honestly have, for, for a lot of folks, the first time engaging in a, in a project such as this. Um, so there's a lot of excitement, a, lo a lot of the time in general with this outreach folks want to jump right to like, it is, when's the bridge going to be closed? Am I going to be able to get across the river? How much is the toll going to be? A lot of that stuff. And, and so it's, it's good that we are on the front um, end of the project and, and trying to engage early, but uh, folks are definitely eager to get to the, the real things that impact their lives. I'm going to turn it back to Ray to, to wrap us up with uh, the timeline and, and next steps. Sure. Next slide, please. So um, uh, the next couple of months are a really busy time. As you mentioned, that we are meeting with <clears throat> a lot of uh, uh, councils and co uh, committees like this um, and, and sharing the updates to the program and, and gathering that feedback. But we'll be taking, with the, with the endorsement of the ESG, taking the uh, recommended LP, modified LPA uh, through boards and councils um, and looking for their consensus. Um, we'll be looking in July after that, assuming we get that, uh, taking it to our executive steering, steering group <clears throat> to have them consider that adoption with that support of their boards and councils, and then taking it to our bi-state legislative committee uh, to consider and also respond. <clears throat> but this fall and winter, we'll be starting that supplemental uh, environmental impact statement process, uh, but also with that uh, uh, support and understanding what the uh, project elements are really starting to look like, we'll be updating the conceptual finance plan. One was done that was based on the prior efforts and, and some modifications that was escalated to uh, 
a, a potential uh, construction window for IBR. But we'll use this work to actually develop a program specific estimate and updated financial plan. And then uh, in later in 23, 25, uh, we'll get to the questions a lot of people are asking, which is what are the, what's the toll rates gonna be? How are we funding this? Um, and uh, uh, how many uh, federal dollars are we pulling in to help support delivery of this pro program? And um, uh, what, uh, what's the design gonna look like? So uh, that'll continue to develop. Next slide, please. Yeah, great questions. I think it's where you all want to be. Thank you. Questions up? Katie. Yeah, I was um, kind of trying to think of the, the old, uh, there was a lot of questions that swirled around the, um, the last bridge. And it sounds like you're, using a lot of the information from that. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask about is if you're using, if you're going to be using tolling, is it, would it be as part of an effort with the 205 bridge or would it be itself? Because I would think that you could end up with a situation where people would be shunted over the 205 bridge because they wouldn't want to be um, tolled. So, are you is that part of the concept is that something that you're going to be thinking about um we great question thank you for that we um back in the previous effort there were no other plans to toll um other parts of i5 or i205 and so uh, we were going to look at what diversion might happen um uh, but we weren't necessarily planning to go toll 205. um Today is different. There's the Oregon Tolling Program, which is looking at tolling that uh, um, I-5 and I-205 and uh, will be in place soon after uh, we would exact um, and um, begin tolling for IBR. And so that um, shift or diversion of traffic, um, actually, as we've, as we've looked at the modeling uh, that we've, we've done to date, is that it actually bounces out and shifts a little more traffic to I-5. But a lot of the traffic that's in the program area, 75% of it originates within 15 miles of the program area and exits in the same area. So um, um, those trips really aren't gonna divert. Um, they, they're using the program area. What, they, what tolling will do um, is uh, start to impact some of those discretionary trips um, that people could take at a different time because the variable troll rates will vary depending on uh, the traffic volumes um, to a degree. So does that answer your question? Yeah, it helps. Um, so it sounds like you are considering 205 at the same time and that they would be, they would, they would be um, just doing the one bridge and not the other one. Well, they're separate efforts. So the, right. the, the yeah, the, the, this would be for IBR to be a section 129 tolling to pay for a project. Uh, the the uh, Oregon tolling program is a, is a separate but related pro program. So those tolls would not be used to um, fund IBR. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Oriana, and then Eli and Valeria. Yeah, I was heartened to see that you had received some feedback from tribal governments, but I'm curious why tribal governments are not part of the decision-making body that oversees this project. Yeah, that's that's a that's a great question. Um, uh, we do have um, some uh, tribal representation on our CAG, um, but the uh, the tribal governments are, as you know, um, uh, sovereign nations. And so uh, we work with through our federal partners to work with them uh, directly as a nation to nation engagement. And so uh, that engagement is ongoing and, and uh, has its own um, uh, kind of cadence to engage and, and work with the tribe. So that is happening. It's just not happening in the, the CAG or EHE. Right, Eli. Well, thank you for presenting. I um, 
I should start off by saying what I support. I support replacement of the bridge for seismic reasons and tolling it um, to manage use. Um, I'm kind of incredulous that Portland is claiming that this bridge, which is about five miles long, up to 10 lanes wide, um, follows or, or supports our climate action goal. Um, I, I've got a, a bunch of thoughts on it, but I want to ask just one technical question because the images we have are from above, not from the side. Um, as I understand, so the question is how high above Hayden um, Island would the bridge be as it passes over? I've heard about 50 feet. Um, this thing would be about the width of half a football field, as I understand it. Um, what's going to hold it up? Like a berm, structural support. If there's a light rail station, how do you get up and down from it? And what would that impact be to Hayden Island? People, um, transportation impacts um, on that island for people or at ground level. And so I'll, I'll start with that. I might have some other questions later. I think I will, but let me just pose those to you. Thanks. Yeah, so those are all good questions. Those are detailed questions that we'll be working on as we refine the design. We don't have that type of alignment data that uh, can get there now, but, um, and whether or not the, the um, interstate touches down uh, at grade on the island is yet to be designed. Um, if it is elevated, um, then uh, that would provide potentially for opportunities of land development and open space underneath the bridge. But what we are uh, planning to do is is connect the island in a way it hasn't been uh, for a while is Tomahawk Island Drive and connect that road network. I do believe that's still part of that conceptual plan. <clears throat> um, so um, a lot of the questions you're asking are, are ones that we'll develop as we design um, more into the future. Okay, so can I check on this? So the plan is to constrain to one of these options and commit to that option without answering the question of what's going to hold it up in the air, how high it will be, um, what it will so, cost, and how you're going to fund it. I mean, this, I'm a developer, so for background, yeah. I would never proceed on a project with all those up in the air and not be still looking at other options for the development. Um, so I, I guess I have a concern, partly, like, there are some good things to do on this project, but um, there's opportunity costs. I mean, there's a lot of equity headway we can make by, for example, taking local ownership of state orphan highways or other things that can have achieve goals. Um, this project would suck up a massive amount of resources. Um, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm fairly surprised that, that city council would consider um, in other governments locking into one option that is the, probably the most expensive one, at least that I could figure out, or without having explored others. So that's that's a question. Yeah, so maybe I can address some of your questions. So um, what it will be founded on, for the bridges themselves, they will have drilled shafts that go down to the Caldera Formation. If you're aware of the geotechnical conditions here, we've got liquefiable soils that are approximately 200 feet deep that get down to that trout for, for Troutdale formation. So the structures themselves will have, have foundations that, that uh, support them that deep. Where we are touching down at grade, there may be ground improvements necessary because they sit on those same liquefiable soils. Um, but um, the, um, this program has, has resulted from um, uh, previous work, like I mentioned, but before that, decades of work at looking at the region's programs, regions issues in this corridor and defining them. So there's been a, a large body of work to identify and, and agree regionally that we want to solve this problem. Um, <clears throat> and so that's leading to this choice today. And, and things we bring into the modified LPA aren't really detailed design that you're talking about. It's the major building blocks that we'll continue to study and refine in the supplemental process. <clears throat> That's the way major, many, many of these projects develop. Uh, and then lastly, um, uh, I, I understand your comment about, you know, there's other costs, there's other needs, right? And I definitely agree with that. <clears throat> um, but those needs and fun, th those are the needs aren't gonna draw the money that this program will. Uh, and uh, and so I, I, the, it, those funds that, that we would draw wouldn't necessarily be drawn by those other efforts. And so it's not really a straight comparison that there's a, a direct opportunity cost. Um, 
Eli, you're you're muted. Are you saying that the federal funds being proposed for this project are ineligible for some of those other projects that I mentioned? Um, well, um, the the funds that this program will be seeking, the grant programs from the infrastructure bill, will be the mega and the bridge project, a big grant, bridge grants. And so um, I'm not sure they qualify. Um, I don't know the projects you're talking about. Uh, Valeria, and then I'd like to jump in. Thanks. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, two questions. My first one is, I saw that there was a lot of specific feedback provided. Um, I'm wondering if that rendering that we saw, I think in the first few slides, is that already sort of uh, considering that input that has, or the feedback that has been provided, or what kind of changes to the plan itself or to the project itself um, uh, resulted from the feedback provided so far from, from these different advisories because a lot of times we provide feedback but like um I understand budget constraints and you know like how are you I guess um deciding when you can um implement that type of feedback for the project that you're having um and my second question is um what is different this time around from previous efforts to do something like this um uh, like you know, I, I, I'm i just interested um, on the context of like, what is different about the momentum that we currently have right now? Thanks. Sure. No, great questions. <clears throat> really good question. So um, I think, you know, the work that we've been going through over the last year and a half has been that engagement with the executive, or the e executive uh, steering group, the um, community advisor group, the um, equity advisor group, our bi-state community and all of our community outreach. Um, the advisor groups have been engaged to give us feedback and help craft those screening criteria um, to help inform the design options that were evaluated and then combined into this LPA that I showed you today. So they provided direct feedback that has shaped the outcome. Um, uh, and uh, you know, Jake may be able to speak some, you know, specific examples from the EAG, but, um, but you know, the, the Hayden Island is a great example, interchange there. Um, the previous effort had a full interchange there. Um, you know, and we listened to the community that said they want um, uh, access through the local no road network off the island that isn't on the interstate. This provides an option of a local access bridge that, that answers that man, that addresses that issue. Um, it also um, has um, uh, a one auxiliary line. The previous effort had two. So we've looked at how do we how do we right size the bridge uh, in, in reaction to what's changed in feedback we've received so that we minimize the impact to the island um, and still provide the connectivity they want. So those are a couple of good examples of how that input has, has gotten there. Um, and then you, you asked what's changed. Um, well, I think one of those things that's changed was, was the uh, bi-state legislative committee. So that support, that bi-state support has been invaluable for that feedback and input uh, to understand what we need to do to continue to garner their support. Um, I think our focus on, on equity and climate and, and bringing uh, Jake and John L on and the team uh, to help lead that effort is, is, is groundbreaking for a mega project. So that's something we're really proud of. We've also, uh, along with a principal equity officer, we have a, uh, a principal climate officer on the program too, to help us focus uh, and bring that expertise to the table uh, as it continues to develop. Um, we've, um, one of the exciting things that happened in the meantime, but after the previous effort uh, was uh, stalled, um, is that the, the transit agency in Vancouver, CTRAN, didn't stop developing their, their network. They continue to develop a robust transit system using BRT. And in, in very the same areas that um, the CRC was planning to do. So that's exciting and it's an opportunity for us to combine the best uh, transit elements of 
of light rail into BRT and connect and maximize those systems and, and look at a uh, really a suite of transit solutions. Um, uh, uh, the LRT, BRT, uh, a bus on shoulder, those all are complementary services that will serve uh, the folks that, um, that, that need them as well as provide options for people that want to get out of their car. And, and we have some mode shift to also help deal with um, um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, as well as congestion. So those are, those are a few things. I mean, we could go on and on, but it's, uh, I can tell them. Oh, that was really, that. really helpful. Thank you so much for those answers. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Ariana? Yeah, I'm curious to better understand uh, how cost overruns will be addressed in this project and in particular how how the uh, community advisory uh, body and equity advisory body are giving input on just the impact this project will have and the potential to do other projects and how that that ecosystem is is being weighed within this project itself. Hmm. <clears throat> well, um, well, there are the cost over on the issue. Um, I think we're all seeing inflation hit. We're seeing projects cost more and more. <clears throat> And since we are, you know, leading into that, defining the major program elements, as I mentioned, we'll be looking at creating a new program estimate. And that program estimate will not be a number; it'll be a range of um, a range that includes um, understanding the risk and, and not only risk from um, uh, that would develop as uh, uh, that you might find in the field, like like an unknown foundation condition, but it'll also include include that uh, inflation risk. And, and look out and, and escalate for the potential years of construction. This will be, we call it a program because it's, it, is a, it is a combination of probably 20 to 25, or will be 20 to 25 construction contracts spread out over up to 15 years. So it is a, it is a program and, and understanding uh, and trying to project that using a risk-based estimating process that uses a Monte Carlo analysis to help you quantify that is one of those steps we'll do. Um, and we'll continue to do VEs and the risk assessments every year as we update and understand how risks show up or get mitigated uh, and uh, try to stay on top of that. So that, that is one way. <clears throat> um, uh, but uh, uh, the other is, is you know, staying in tune with, with um, industry standards and issues, uh, looking at what's happening across the nation, what's happening with supply chain and commodities so that we can forecast and trend and bring those into our, our planning processes. Um, so I think that hopefully that answers your question around some of the cost escalation or inflation issues or overruns. The other is we've got bodies that set a budget for us. So um, as we look to set a program estimate, um, then we'll have uh, change management processes with our, our, um, our principals to uh, help manage any change up or down that we need to worry about. <clears throat> um, and remind me what your second part of the question was, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was related. It was just better understanding how you are seeking feedback from the community uh, advisory group and the equity advisory group around how the cost of this project impacts other things communities are interested in seeing happen and how you're just weighing that like you know suite of of costs that will be uh accrued by this project over many years as you're saying or this program as as you named it how, how are you weighing like what is important to communities that will be impacted potentially by this work yeah so i i think i think um you know that the the choice of this program lies with our um, our program partners and the legislatures, and so they, uh, especially the legislature, will make the choice of how they want to allocate funds and and what they think um, uh, deserves funding. But um, if I'm thinking about the advisory groups uh, and how they provide input, we're definitely going to be looking at them on on how these this program can can bring benefits to. Um, to the local communities or, and uh, uh, understand the dollars that would be spent by um, completing a, um, uh, um, a 
well, I'm trying to remember the acronym, too many acronyms, um, a yeah. um, investment, um, um, what's that, Jake? The CBA, Community Benefits. Well, well, we'll do, yeah, we'll be doing, um, well, we'll be looking at a, a project labor agreement as well as a project uh, community benefits agreement and, and uh, what components uh, we want, or we'll hear from our advisory groups on what makes sense and what would make the most benefit. We're also looking at, at an impact, uh, economic impact analysis to understand what's the breadth of jobs that will be created and how can we um, uh, grow careers uh, for our communities of concern throughout this program and the, and the uh, investments that are being made in the region. We know that we've got pretty large projects that are happening uh, south of the program and starting up before us. And so we see this continuum of work as a big way to grow wealth in our community um, uh, and and grow uh, careers and jobs. So I think that's part of our focus and, and maybe Jay can speak some more to that. Um, I, I just actually was was curious um, for, for you, Ariana, about some thinking around how we might engage the advisory groups on on that issue because I as someone who you know uh, coordinates the the EAG and that it's not something I had thought about about how we really do engage them on specifically that the um, the costs and and how that impacts the the rest of what we're really trying to accomplish from an equity perspective. So I think that the first most important thing. Is, is what was just named around, these are asks to the legislature and the legislature only has so much money in each state to allocate. That money that goes to this project may mean that money doesn't go somewhere else. So I think really making that clear to both of the bodies of just understanding that there are some costs that they'll be weighing if they are giving input into budgets or inputs into what goes into a CBA. Um, I think that, that like just baseline understanding and transparency is really important. And then from there, just doing a, a regular check-in with community members to identify, like, if we spend money on this here, are there things that you think might not get funded on your community? And that's asking, you know, folks who may not be super engaged in the politics of state budgets, but nonetheless, like, just giving them the opportunity to weigh or identifying in a CBA how you can roll in community projects that are important because the jobs are important, the economic impact is important, but also the that there's only so much money to go around in the state legislature and making sure that communities are getting funded and supported for what they want to see and they're not supporting some element of this project that then leads to the unintended consequence of, of something else not getting funded. So I think that to just summarize transparency and then giving folks the opportunity to uh, contribute maybe outside of the box ideas about what get weight gets like rolled into some of the project costs, because then that does create some political surety that if, you know, your budget item gets rolled into the cost of this project and it's a related project and it's relevant and it has positive community impact in the way that you all are intending, um, that's like a, a more sure way than lobbying the legislature straight out of the general fund. And I'm putting on my wonk hat here a little bit, but happy, happy to chat more on the side. But I think we really want to make sure that this, this project really has positive impacts in community and doesn't have the unintended consequences of neighborhood projects or community projects not getting funded as a result. Great idea. Yeah, really appreciate that perspective. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna roll in if you don't mind, Valeria. Um, I had a question about uh, community engagement going forward. One, thank you for that presentation. I appreciate you all also staying a little a little longer, um, and I also appreciate that this is one one briefing along um, a timeline. And those of us who have been, it were heavily involved in the the last iteration when it had a different three letter acronym. Um, that we uh, that we know that this will not be the last time we meet. Um, I'm curious for July and recognizing this is a briefing, and July sixth. You mentioned to city council is is that a hearing? What and what are the opportunities for both Portlanders and those in the region to to engage who have not been selected or do not have the time uh, disposable time to uh, engage more fully on an advisory group? And I'll have a comment after. I might have the city talk to their city 
council meeting and how that's going. They're still here. Yeah, Patrick or Caitlin. Yeah, um, so the July 6th will be a public hearing. So uh, as part of um, you know, city council consideration of the resolution, uh, it, a public hearing is a part of uh, that meeting. And then uh, also, um, we are going to be working, um, you know, across bureaus and then uh, with uh, city council offices and developing uh, LPA, sorry, acronyms, locally preferred alternatives, you know, uh, conditions of approval so that, you know, in city council, um, uh, you know, with the intent of moving this forward, there will be uh, these conditions of approval uh, that go with a decision. So, um, you know, these are, and it, it's, it's kind of typically the way these uh, mega projects go. Um, you know, we've typically have, we've worked with TriMet in the past for like light rail corridors, and we've had these major decision points. There are conditions of approval um, that help, you know, across bureaus and uh, with input from uh, folks like yourselves uh, so that we can make sure that it's going to perform the way that we want to. I think you can just a, a quick follow up question and then a comment. Um, and then uh, what is the scope of that resolution? I'm just curious what, where are we now that that members of the public would be invited to? It could go many ways. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot to talk about on, on the project. So is there is there a scope of the resolution? Oh, like a, that like folks a, would be asked to something to react to. Um, yeah. There, uh, there is not at the moment. Um, however, um, we are coordinating with our partner agencies such as TriMet, the Metro, City of Vancouver, um, to make sure that um, you know the conditions of approval that each entity will have with their uh, resolution. So we want to make sure that there's nothing conflicting. <laughs> Right. So, um, but so pretty much we are still working on uh, fleshing our conditions of approval out. We don't have anything ready to share. However, uh, I think that could be possible that, um, well, and also we would love your input on if you would have um, any kind of anything specific uh, that you could think of that could help us in uh, develop conditions of approval. And we've asked for the same thing from uh, the Bike Advisory Committee, the Pedestrian Advisory Committee, uh, and then recently with Historic Landmarks and um, you know, Design Commission and Freight Committee are coming up. So um, this, is, this is help that we're asking for, uh, for all these uh, commissions and committees. Uh, if they would like to uh, you know, write a letter to city council and then um, or you know, recommendations for staff to include these things or, or any kind of specifics, that would be welcoming. Thank you. Our, I mean, obviously our time has elapsed uh, pretty much for uh, to consider today, but um, I would imagine and hope that we could have some uh, offline conversations, perhaps in officers or others and, and elicit um, other feedback. Um, other, Valeria, you had your, your hand up before we yeah, I mean, I know we're at time. I was just curious in the rendering. I couldn't really tell if there was um, if there's going to be a bike lane and where that would be. But um, I know maybe that's more down the road potentially. So no worries if that can't be well, answered. That's a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, as I was trying to rush through, uh, you didn't get to see that, but there is a I think it's purple line that um, that would go along that local access bridge. Uh, connect to the 40, uh, start and connect to the 40 mile loop, connect on that local access bridge, uh, go across the island, um, then connect to the main river crossing and then back down into Vancouver. Um, and uh, it would provide much, much better facilities for active transportation. So if you, if you see that uh, in the uh, presentation, that's what that is. Perfect. That's helpful. Thank you. I couldn't sure. tell. Thanks. Brianna? 
I just wanted to make a, a quick, very quick request uh, related to any uh, communication that uh, this body makes around this project, which is that we are stewards of the climate plan for the city. So I hope that uh, any, any letter we sent would weigh how this project does and does not help Portland meet its climate goals, not just the climate action plan, but also the emergency climate resolution uh, and those other uh, uh, pieces of, of legislation that uh, the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability has helped move through council. Thank you. That was uh, about uh, my last comment. Uh, if I could, uh, as we are a little past, a little past time, uh, that both Washington and Oregon, as I don't need to tell anyone here, I'm sure, um, over 40% of our carbon emissions derives from transportation. Uh, that has not changed. Um, our climate goals are uh, emergent. Uh, and, um, and so a question of if this large project, um, how, does that, how does that help us towards it? Um, I will share as someone who was on the ODOT Region One Area Commission on Transportation for four years. Um, and as we talked, um, a number of times on some projects that involved auxiliary lanes. Um, understand we we talk about auxiliary lanes as not real lanes. Uh, there is also there's nothing that I have seen in Ashto that just to actually quantify what an auxiliary lane is. Um, so there's there's and there are so many rabbit holes. Uh, we can and probably will uh, go down on this project. I appreciate everyone there, I 100% agree, I think, are, are achieving our climate goals and ensuring a more climate just for future is a critical component of this. And, and if there are no last, last thoughts that anyone needs to get out in order to have a decent night's sleep, I will thank everyone here for being here, for in, uh, for joining us on this conversation, one of many. Um, thank you to the project team, and I am sure we will all be in touch. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity and the good questions. Appreciate it. Thank you. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you so much, thank commissioners. You. Have a great evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.